So now let's begin chapter 26 in Robinson Cotran Pathological Basis of Disease. So this chapter is all about bones, joints and soft tissue tumors. So moving on to bone, let's start with a discussion about the basic structure and function of bone. The adult human skeleton is composed of 206 bones, you've been learning that since second grade. And these bones account for 12% of the body weight. Bone functions include mechanical support, phones, force transmission, internal organ protection and mineral homeostasis. So basically you have bones that provide mechanical support. So you have your axial and appendicular skeleton for that. You have force transmission. Okay. And then you have internal organ protection. So you have the rib cage, the skull. Okay. And then you also have mineral homeostasis or calcium homeostasis, phosphate homeostasis. And it also serves as the major site of hem hematopoiesis during postnatal life. Okay. So the bone marrow. So bone consists of extracellular matrix and several cell types. So what are the functions? It provides support, it provides protection, it, prov uh, it plays a role in mineral homeostasis, it also transmits force, and also it is a site of homeostasis, sorry, hematopoiesis. Moving on to matrix, the extracellular component of bone, the matrix is composed of osteoid and minerals. So bone, extracellular matrix, equals osteoid okay osteoid plus minerals osteoid is a basic uh, structural framework of the uh, bone and then mineralization is done to make it a complete bone all right so 35 percent is osteoid and 65 percent is minerals so the latter primarily hydroxyapatite so you can remember it like this the way you've read it 3 ca3 po4 Hold twice dot C A O H twice. Okay, so you get that. So they give bone its hardness and and also hydroxyapatite serves as a repository for 99% of the calcium and 85% of the phosphorus in the body. So hydroxyapatite gives bone its hardness and also serves as a repository for calcium and phosphorus in the body. Osteoid consists of type one collagen in smaller amounts of glycosaminoglycans and other proteins. One of these proteins, osteopontin, also called osteocalcin, is produced by osteoblasts and contributes to the regulation of bone formation, mineralization and calcium homeostasis. Serum osteopontin levels are used as a specific marker of osteoblast activity. So bone maturation and metabolism are also sensitive to cytokines and growth factors and are thus regulated by diverse inputs which include locally and systematically produced factors as well as mechanical force. So basically you have the bone matrix which is composed of 65% minerals uh, which primarily include hydroxyapatite. They, uh, they give bone its hardness and serve as a storage repository for phosphorus and calcium in the body. And then you have osteoid which consists of type 1 collagen and smaller am amounts of glycosaminoglycans or GAGs okay, and other proteins. So collagen plus GAGs plus protein. So what is that protein? The major protein is osteopontin which contributes to regulation of bone. It is produced by osteoblasts. It's also called osteocalcin and also contributes to bone mineralization and calcium homeostasis. It can be used as a specific marker of osteoblast activity. Okay, so bone matrix can be woven or lamellar. So as you can see in this figure right here, you can see woven bone, okay? You can see in this figure, you can see woven bone and lamellar bone. So you can see the lamellae, okay? Which contrasts with the more cellular disorganized appearance of woven bone. See, lamellar bone appears organized and it is somewhat less cellular when compared to the more cellular woven bone. So you can see all these cells in woven bone. So woven bone is produced rapidly, okay? So for rapid uh, production, you need more cells, right? So it has more cells. So during fetal development, you have woven bone or during fracture repair, you have woven bone. But the half hazard arrangement of collagen fibers imparts less structural integrity than the parallel collagen fibers of lamellar bone. So woven bone is always abnormal in adults, but its presence is not specific for any particular disease because in fracture repair also you can have woven bone. Long bones are composed of a dense outer cortex and an inner medulla, on a central medulla. So this is the outer cortex and this is the central medulla. Okay. So the latter is supported by bony trabeculae, the medulla. So it has bony trabeculae interspersed with marrow, which may be fatty or white and hematopoietic or red. Okay. 
So now let's move on to the cells of the bone. The cellular components of bone include osteoblasts, osteocytes and osteoclasts. So osteoblasts on the surface of the osteoid matrix synthesize, transport and assemble matrix and regulate mineralization. So as you can see in this figure, 26.2a, right? So you can see active osteoblasts which are synthesizing the bone matrix, okay? All of this is the bone matrix, okay? And all these active osteocytes on the surface uh, of the osteoid matrix, they synthesize it. So osteoblast activity is tightly regulated by hormonal and local mediators. So quiescent osteoblast, which can be recognized by a decrease in cytoplasmic volume, may remain on the trabecular surface or become embedded with the, within the matrix as osteocytes. So if you have rapidly functional osteoblasts, you have a greater cytoplasmic volume, but quiescent ones, as you can see here, less lesser cytoplasmic volume okay they're on the surface of the matrix and they secrete the matrix okay so as they keep secreting the matrix okay the matrix gets pushed to the center and these things they sit on it okay on the periphery so osteocytes are interconnected by an intricate network of dendritic cytoplasmic processes through tunnels canaliculi within the matrix so if you remember the basic histology, so these are the osteocytes, they are connected by canaliculi within the matrix. So osteocytes help control calcium and phosphate levels in the microenvironment, whereas osteoblasts secrete the matrix. And osteocytes also detect mechanical forces, translate those forces into biological activity, and this is called mechanotransduction. So osteocytes perform mechanotransduction, osteoblasts perform matrix synthesis. Okay, whereas osteoclasts are specialized multinucleated macrophages that are derived from circulating monocytes and they resorb the bone. Okay, here in this figure you can see osteocytes. So two osteoclasts, you can see them resorbing the bone. Okay, here you can see the bone being resorbed. Okay, like this. So surface integrin proteins allow osteoclasts to attach to the matrix and create a sealed extracellular trench or a resorption pit okay so on the osteo on the extracellular matrix of the bone you have surface integrins okay surface integrin proteins okay they allow the osteoclasts to uh, attach to the matrix and create a sealed extracellular trench or a resorption pit into which the bone can be resorbed Secretion of acid and neutral proteases, predominantly matrix metalloproteases, into the pit results in dissolution of inorganic and organic bone components. So what they do is basically on the extracellular matrix of the bone, you have uh, integrins, surface integrins. They help osteoclasts to attach. Okay, The osteoclasts then create a sealed extracellular pit into which they deposit metalloproteinases and acidic su uh, neutral substances which results in dissolution of inorganic and organic bone components into that pit, that sealed pit, okay? Moving on to the development of bone. Most bones that form during embryogenesis develop from a cartilage mold via endochondral classification, sorry, endochondral ossification. The cartilage mold or analogen is synthesized by a mesenchymal precursor cells. A central medullary canal within the analogen is created by chondroblasts at approximately 8 weeks of gestation. Simultaneously, osteoblasts begin to deposit the cortex beneath the nascent periosteum of the midshaft or the diaphysis. This forms a primary center of ossification resulting in radial bone growth. Okay, so let, uh, if you can just uh, see what's happening. So first, most bones form from a cartilage mold via endochondral classification. The cartilage mold is, or the analogen is synthesized by mesenchymal precursor cells. So first you have mesenchymal precursor cells, okay. They, uh, they are synthesizing the analogen, okay, or the cartilage mold. So the central medullary canal is created by the osteochondroblasts at approximately eight weeks, okay. So like this, eight weeks the central medullary canal is created within the analogen. Simultaneously, osteoblasts begin to deposit the cortex beneath the nascent periosteum. Okay, they begin to deposit the periosteum, uh, uh, cortex beneath the periosteum. Okay, and this forms a primary center of ossification resulting in radial bone growth. Okay, like this, radial bone growth. 
at the longitudinal ends or the epiphysis endochondral ossification forms secondary centers of ossification okay at the epiphysis here so eventually plates of cartilage and uh, anlage become entrapped between the expanding centers of ossification forming physis or growth plates so you can see that in this figure so active growth plate uh, growth plate on, uh, on with ongoing endochondral ossification here you can see the reserve zone okay here you can see the zone of proliferation here you can see the zone of hypertrophy okay the reserve zone zone of proliferation you can see cells you can see the zone of hypertrophy the cells are enlarging in size and then you can see the zone of mineralization and then you can see the primary spongiosa okay so chondrocytes within the growth plates undergo sequential proliferation hypertrophy and apoptosis so matrix mineralizes during apoptosis and is invaded by capillaries providing the nutrients for activation of osteoblasts and osteoid synthesis most calcified cartilage matrix is ultimately resorbed leaving only strut shaped remnants that serve as scaffolding for bone deposits known as primary spongiosa the earliest bone trabeculae over time this process produces longitudinal bone growth <coughs> flat bones for example the cranium are formed by intramembranous ossification in which a dense layer of mesenchyme is directly ossified by osteoblasts without a cartilage anlagen bones enlarged by deposition of new bone on a pre-existing surface a process called appositional growth apposition remember it as deposition so basically on the bony framework itself there is no anlagen on the bony framework itself you have deposition of new bone on the pre-existing bony surface and this is appositional growth so local and systemic factors that regulate bone development include the following so first and foremost growth hormone gh secreted by the anterior pituitary gland induces and maintains chondrocyte proliferation and then you have thyroid hormone secreted by the thyroid gland which acts on proliferating chondrocytes to induce, induce hypertrophy then you have indian hedgehog ih it is secreted locally by the prehypertrophic chondrocytes and coordinates co uh, chondrocyte proliferation and differentiation with osteoblast proliferation so you have gh you have thyroid hormone so uh, t3 and t4 thyroid hormones and then you have indian hedgehog ihh and then you have parathyroid hormone okay parathormone uh, so parathyroid hormone related protein basically produced by perichondrial stromal cells and early proliferating chondrocytes which activates the pth receptor to maintain chondrocyte proliferation then you have wnt signaling growth factors so wnt growth factors which are expressed in the growth plate proliferating zone via and via frizzled and lrp5/6 receptors lrp5 or 6 receptors or frizzled receptors they activate beta catenin to promote chondrocyte proliferation and maturation then you have sox9 Okay, where your sox now it is a transcription factor expressed by proliferating but not hypertrophic chondrocytes that is essential for differentiation of chondrocyte precursors then you have bone right so you can run so run x2 so it is a transcription factor expressed in early hypertrophic chondrocytes okay what is not uh, expressed by hypertrophic chondrocytes so think of uh, hypertrophy here as energy okay so you still don't have energy so what do you do you wear your sox so sox9 non hypertrophic chondrocytes express this transcription factor whereas chondrocytes that are hypertrophic they they can run right so they express run x2 which is a transcription factor and this controls terminal chondrocyte and osteoblast differentiation okay so fibroblast growth factors obviously uh, so fgf uh, they are secreted by a variety of mesenchymal cells and fgfs most notably fgf3 act on hypertrophic chondrocytes to inhibit proliferation and promote differentiation and you also have bone morphogenic proteins so bmps members of the tgf beta signaling pathway uh, they are expressed at various genes of chondrocyte development and have diverse effects on the chondrocyte proliferation and hypertrophy at the growth plate okay so what do you have you have growth hormone which maintains chondrocyte proliferation it is secreted by the anterior pituitary then you have th thyroid hormones which induces hypertrophy on the proliferating chondrocytes okay first you have growth hormone causing chondrocyte proliferation and then you have thyroid hormone which is causing the proliferating chondrocytes to undergo hypertrophy then you have indian hedgehog okay it coordinates the proliferation and differentiation again you have parathyroid hormone related proteins because parathyroid hormone receptors need to be activated 
okay and then you have wnt signaling and uh, beta uh, which acts by the beta catenin pathway to promote contracite proliferation almost all of these promote proliferation thyroid hormone promotes differentiation then you have sox9 which promotes differentiation of chondrocytes and then you have run x2 which is expressed in uh, hypertrophic chondrocytes and promotes differentiation into osteoblasts okay then you have fibroblast growth factors and again which uh, which actually acts on hypertrophic chondrocytes to inhibit proliferation okay to promote differentiation fgf comes in the last and it causes differentiation it inhibits proliferation and then finally bone morphogenic proteins members of the tgf beta family and it has effects on hypertrophy at the growth plate now moving on to homeostasis and remodeling the adult skeleton appears static but actually undergoes continuous change via a tightly regulated process known as remodeling this process which turns over approximately 10% of the skeleton each year repairs damage and may change the shape of bones in response to mechanical forces so remodeling occurs within the bone or basic multicellular unit so bone multicellular unit or basic multicellular unit which consists of a unit of coupled osteoblast and osteoclast activity on the bone surface so if this is a bone surface you have osteoclast activity and osteoblast activity which is coupled together to form a basic multicellular unit or the bone multicellular unit so osteoclast attachment bone resorption osteo blast attachment and proliferation and finally matrix synthesis occurs sequentially at the bmu so first you have old bone okay you need to destroy it so you have osteoclast attachment and uh, resorption of the bone then you have osteoblast attachment and then you have synthesis formation of new bone and finally synthesis of the matrix events at the bmu are regulated by cell to cell interactions and cytokines and several signaling pathways one pathway involves three factors the transmembrane receptor activator for nf kappa b or rank Okay, remember in Guyton physiology, you learnt you learnt about the rank like and okay, so which is expressed on osteoclast precursors, so osteoclasts, clasts. Okay, they care about their rank. Okay, K C. Okay, so clast rank. So uh, which is expressed on osteoclast precursors, rank like and which is expressed on osteoblasts. Okay. and marostromal cells and osteoprotegrin or opg protegerin opg which is a secreted decoy receptor made by osteoblast and several other cell types of cells that binds rank ligand and thus prevents its inter- interaction with rank okay so rank is present on osteoclasts rank ligand is present on osteoblasts and you have osteoprotegerin which is a decoy receptor made by osteoblasts so osteoblasts have okay osteo blasts have osteoprotegerin and also they have rank ligand whereas only rank or nf kappa b is present on what you have the receptor activator on osteoclast so when stimulated by rank ligand rank signaling okay rank ligand is present on osteoblast so when si- when stimulated by osteoblast having rank ligand rank signaling activates nf kappa b which is essential for the generation and survival of osteoclasts a second important pathway involves macrophage colony stimulating factor or mcsf a factor produced by osteoblast that is also crucial for the generation of osteoclasts finally wnt proteins produced by osteoprogenitor cells bind to lrp5 and lrp6 on osteoblast to activate the beta catenin signaling and osteoprotogerin opg synthesis okay so conversely you have osteocytes which produce sclerostin which inhibits wnt beta catenin synthesis uh, signaling and promotes bone formation the importance of these pathways is emphasized by rare germline mutations in opg rank rank like and lrp5 and sclerostin genes which severely disrupt bone metabolism and produce congenital bone disorders the balance between bone formation and resorption is modulated by rank and wnt signaling for example because opg and rank like and oppose one another okay so remember once again opg is present on osteoblast rank like and is present again on osteoblast but it activates osteoclasts okay so they oppose one another bone resorption or formation can be favored by increasing or decreasing the rank to opg ratio systemic factors affecting this balance include hormones such as par- pth estrogen testosterone and glucocorticoids 
You have vitamin D, you have inflammatory cytokines such as IL-1 and growth factors such as bone morphogenic factors. Each of these acts by altering the rank NF-kappa B and WNT beta catenin signaling. So you have parathyroid hormone IL-1 and glucocorticoids which promote osteoclast differentiation and bone turnover while bone morphogenic proteins and sex hormones generally block osteoclast differentiation or activity by promoting OPG expression alterations that favor bone deposition. So another level of control involves paracrine signaling between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Matrix breakdown by osteoclasts liberates and activates growth factors, cytokines and enzymes such as collagenase, some of which stimulate osteoblasts. Thus substances that initiate bone deposition are released into the microenvironment during bone resorption. Peak bone mass is achieved in early adulthood after the cessation of skeletal growth and is determined by factors that include vitamin D receptor and LRP5 or 6 polymorphisms, nutrition, physical activity, age and hormonal status. Beginning in the fourth decade, however, resorption exceeds formation resulting in a steady decline in skeletal mass in the fourth decade. Here you can see paracrine molecular mechanisms that regulate osteoclast formation and function. So osteoclasts are derived from the same mononuclear cells that differentiate into macrophages, okay? So osteoblast or stromal cell membrane associated rank ligand, okay? So here you have osteoprote... Uh, okay, so here you have... This is the osteoblast, okay? So this is the osteoblast. On the osteoblast, what do you have? You have the rank ligand. At the same time, you have the osteoprotogerin, okay? So osteoprotogerin blocks the rank rank ligand interaction. Okay, but when rank rank ligand interaction is present, rank see rank is present. The rank is a receptor which is present on osteoclasts. Okay, so when rank ligand binds to rank, so it activates the osteoclast, causes their differentiation via the NF kappa B signaling pathway, and then the bone is resorbed. So rank ligand binds to its receptor rank located on the cell surface of osteoclast precursors functions in concert with the macrophage colony stimulating factor MCSF. Okay, so it functions MCSF in concert with MCSF. So rank activation induces precursor cells to become functional osteoclasts. Osteoblasts and stromal cells also secrete osteoprotogerin which acts as a decoy receptor for rank ligand preventing it from binding the rank on osteoclast precursors. Consequently, OPG prevents bone resorption by inhibiting osteoclast differentiation. Okay, so I hope it is clear now. Okay, you have the rank ligand and osteoprotogerin both on the uh, osteoblast itself. Osteoprotogerin is secreted by the osteoblast. Okay, this is a decoy receptor which prevents rank ligand and rank receptor uh, interactions. Okay, when the interaction happens, bone resorption happens because of activation of osteoclast via the NF kappa B signaling pathway. Moving on to the developmental disorders of bone and cartilage. So developmental abnormalities of the skeleton often stem from inherited mutations and become apparent during the earliest stages of bone formation. In contrast, acquired diseases usually appear in adulthood. The spectrum of disorders of bone development is broad and there is no standard approach to their classification. So here we will categorize the major diseases according to their pathogenesis. So developmental anomalies can result from localized disruption of the migration and condensation of the mesenchyme uh, dysostosis, okay, dysostosis, or global disorganization of bone and cartilage, so dysplasia. So what is dysostosis and what is dysplasia? So localized disruption of the migration and condensation of the mesenchyme is dysostosis, whereas global disorganization of bone and cartilage is dysplasia. Localized is dysostosis, global is dysplasia. So dysostosis may occur in isolation local or as part of more complex syndromes and are caused by defects in mesenchymal condensation and differentiation into cartilage and lage or the cartilage framework. The most common forms include complete absence of a bone or entire digit, aplasia, okay, extra bones or digits such as supernumerary digits. So you can have an absence or you can have an extra and abnormal fusion of bones such as syndactyly or craniosynostosis. Genetic alterations that affect genes in, uh, encoding transcription factors, especially homeobox genes, cytokines and cytokine receptors are especially common among dysostosis. In contrast, dysplasias arise from mutations in genes that control development or remodeling of the entire skeleton. So it is important to note that while the term dysplasia in this context implies abnormal growth, it is not a precursor of neoplasia. Okay, so dysplasia of bone is not a precursor of neoplasia. 
More than 350 skeletal disastrosis and dysplasias are recognized, most of which are extremely rare. The classification has evolved from clinical and radiographic descriptions to one that includes, uh, includes the causative genetic defects. So we'll discuss a table later which lists some of the better characterized developmental abnormalities and their associated defective genes. The relationships between specific mutations and phenotypes are complex. Different point mutations in a single gene, for example, called 2A1, can result in distinct phenotypes while mutations in disparate genes such as LRP5 or rank like and can lead to similar phenotypes. Okay, so let us just discuss this table here. Okay, so here we have diseases of the skeleton with uh, identified genetic defects. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so first let's move on to defects in nuclear proteins and transcription factors. So defects in nuclear proteins and transcription factors, especially homeobox proteins, can result in disorganized mesenchymal condensation and differentiation of osteoblasts and chondrocytes leading to abnormal bone development via dysostosis. Okay. Brachydactyly types T and E are caused by mutations in the homeobox. Okay, homeo box D13 gene, Hox D13 gene, okay, D and E, brachydactyly types D and E are characterized by mutations in homeobox Hox D13 gene and are characterized by shortening of the terminal phalanges of the thumb and big toe respectively, so your thumb and your big toe respectively, okay, shortening. Loss of function mutations in run X2, remember run X2 is uh, a transcription factor secreted by hypertrophic chondrocytes. There is loss of function mutations result in cleidocranial dysplasia, an autosomal dominant disorder characterized by patent fontanelles, delayed closure of cranial sutures, vermian bones, which are extra bones that occur within a cranial suture, delayed eruption of secondary teeth and primitive clavicles and short stature. Okay. Now, moving on to defects in hormones and signaling transduction proteins, but before that, let us just discuss this image here. So, bone cells and their interrelated activities. So, hormones, cytokines, growth factors and signal transducing molecules are instrumental in bone formation and maturation and, al and allow communication between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So, bone resorption and formation and remodeling are coupled processes controlled by systemic factors and local cytokines. So, BMP, you, you have BMP, you have LRP5 or 6, okay. So basically, you have osteoclasts, which are adhering to the surface integrins. They are causing microfractures. They are resorbing the bo uh, bone. So there is liberated matrix-bound growth factors. Okay, then that leads to proliferation of the osteoprogenitor cells. And whenever there is uh, mechanical stress, what happens is surface osteoblasts are stimulated. And again, the defective bone debris is removed by osteoclasts. And then osteoprogenitor cells where the W anti signaling pathway and BMP they activate osteoblasts and again osteocytes they secrete sclerostin which again inhibits the osteoblasts okay so moving on to defects in hormones and signaling transduction proteins so achondroplasia is the most common skeletal dysplasia and a major cause of dwarfism so it is an autosomal dominant disorder ca caused by gain of function mutations in the FGF receptor 3 so FGFR3 what is that? Achondroplasia, most common skeletal dysplasia. So, FGFR3 mutations stem from new mutations in the paternal allele. So, FGF mediated FGFR3 activation normally inhibits endochondral growth. This effect is exaggerated by FGFR3 gain of function mutations. The retarded cartilage growth results in shortened proximal extremities, an enlarged head with bulging forehead. So, shortened proximal extremities, enlarged head with bulging forehead and depression of the root of the nose despite a trunk of relatively normal length okay these skeletal abnormalities are usually uh, not associated with changes in longevity intelligence or reproductive status so achondroplasia what is happening fgfr3 gene mutation gain of function mutation more specifically in the paternal allele mostly it inhibits endochondral growth so basically you have a sunken root of the nose but the trunk is normal and then you have a bulging forehead okay you have a bulging forehead and a long forehead, okay, and uh, basically that's what, and pro a shortening of the proximal uh, limbs. So, 
Thanatophoric dysplasia is the most common lethal form of dwarfism. So, achondroplasia is the most common cause of dwarfism. Thanatophoric dysplasia is a lethal form. So, it affects uh, approximately 1 in every 20,000 life births and it is co- also caused by FTFR3 uh, ga- gain-of-function mutations distinct from those that cause achondroplasia which appear to cause greater increases in FTFR3 signaling than those that produce achondroplasia and thus a more severe phenotype which is lethal. So, affected individuals have disproportionately short or micromelic limbs, frontal bossing obviously, same, relative macrocephaly, same, small chest cavity, proximal shortening of limbs was there in achondroplasia, but here you also have a smaller chest cavity and a bell-shaped abdomen. The underdeveloped thoracic cavity leads to respiratory insufficiency and these individuals frequently die at birth soon or or soon after. So, histological examination of the growth plate reveals reduced chondrocyte proliferation and disorganization within the zone of proliferation. Moving on to defects in extracellular structural proteins. So, mutations in the major bone and cartilage collagen types 1, 2, 9, 10 and 11 give rise to highly variable presentations ranging from lethal disease to premature osteoarthritis. So, first let's discuss type 1 collagen diseases. So, osteogenesis imperfecta. So, osteogenesis imperfecta or brittle bone disease, the most common inherited disorder of connective tissue, is a phenotypically heterogeneous disorder caused by deficiencies in type 1 collagen synthesis. So, osteogenesis imperfecta. I kind of looks like 1, right? So, osteogenesis imperfecta. Type 1 collagen imperfection or deficiency. So, osteogenesis imperfecta primarily affects bone, but it also impacts other tissues rich in type 1 collagen such as joints, eyes, ears, skin and teeth. It is caused by mutations in genes encoding the alpha 1 and alpha 2 chains of type 1 collagen. Many of the over 800 mutations identified lead to replacement of a glycine residue within the triple helical domain with another amino acid. So, glycine residue is replaced within the triple helix. Collagen synthesis and extracellular transport require triple helix formation and these mutations result in misfolding of the collagen polypeptides and defective assembly of the higher order collagen chains. Mutant collagens also interfere with assembly of wild type collagen chains that is they exert a dominant negative effect thereby explaining the autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. So the fundamental abnormality in OI is too little bone resulting in extreme skeletal fragility. Other findings include bo- uh, blue sclerae caused by decreased collagen content. So in the eye also you have type 1 collagen, alright, the suspensory ligaments and in other parts as well. So decreased collagen content because of decreased type 1 collagen. So you have blue sclera. So it makes the sclera translucent and allows partial visualization of the underlying choroid. Why? Because you can see the veins, the choroidal plexus of veins, okay. So, hearing loss related to both a sensory neural deficit and impeded conduction due to abnormalities in the bones of the middle and inner ear. The eye has type 1 collagen. So, if that is not there, you can see translucency of the sclera and you can see the underlying choroidal veins which gives the blue sclera kind of appearance. And then in the ear, you have type 1 collagen. So, any deficiency there results in sensory neural deficit and impaired conduction due to abnormalities of bones in the middle and inner ear. You have dental imperfections, so small misshapen and blue yellow teeth, secondary to dentin deficiency. So osteogenesis imperfecta is separated into four major clinical subtypes of varying severity. Mutations that result in decreased synthesis of qualitatively normal collagen are associated with mild skeletal abnormalities. Decreased synthesis of normal collagen. More severe or lethal phenotypes are associated with mutant or abnormal collagen itself that interfere with triple helix formation. The type 2 variant which is uniformly fatal in utero or during the perinatal period is characterized by extraordinary bone fragility and multiple intrauterine fractures. In contrast, individuals with type 1 osteogenesis imperfecta have a normal lifespan but in experience childhood fractures that decrease in frequency following puberty. Then you can have defects in metabolic pathways such as enzymes, ion channels and transporters. So you have osteopetrosis so which comprises a group of rare genetic diseases characterized by reduced bone resorption due to deficient osteoclast development of function which leads to diffuse symmetric skeletal sclerosis. Okay. Symmetric skeletal sclerosis is seen in osteopetrosis, stone, okay, remember stone or petrify, petrus, osteopetrosis, you can see stones, so symmetrical skeletal sclerosis, SSSS, 
this is the way to remember okay so it is there is reduced bone resorption due to deficient osteoclast development of function although the term osteopetrosis implies that the bones are stone like they are actually brittle and fracture easily osteopetrosis is classified into variants based on both the mode of inheritance and the severity of clinical findings so pathogenesis most of the mutations underlying osteopetrosis interfere with acidification of the osteoclast resorption pit which is required for the dissolution of calcium hydroxy appetite within the matrix so again we talked about this osteoclast how do they act so if there's the bone surface on the surf if this is the ecm sorry of the bone you have integ surface integrin proteins osteoclast uh, bind to them and then they create a sealed of extracellular pit into which the bone is resorbed but if the pit itself is not there because of mutations what happens is if there is acidification of the pit or if pit, the pit itself is not there then sorry uh, if there is interference of the acidification of the pit if it is not properly acidified see acidification is needed for calcium hydroxy appetite dissolution if there is no acidification then that resorption cannot take place that results in osteopetrosis defect and resorption of the bone so for example albers schonberg disease okay again s schonberg albers schonberg disease mild autosomal dominant form of osteopetrosis is caused by mutation of clcn7 calcin7 okay calcin7 okay 7 sssss okay remember this is caused by a uh, mutation of clcn7 which encodes a proton chloride exchanger on the osteoclast surface that is required for resorption pit acidification similarly most cases of autosomal recessive osteopetrosis are caused by a mutation of tcirg1 which encodes a subunit of osteoclast vacuolar h+8 uh, h+ atps that is also necessary for acidification of the resorption pit okay so you have genes that are interfering with uh, uh clcn1 mutation okay it encodes a proton chloride exchanger okay h plus cl minus exchanger on the osteoclast surface so what is that clcn7 mutation or you have takir g1 okay h plus atps okay all of these are necessary for acidification of the pit other causes of autosomal recessive osteopetrosis include defects in carbonic anhydrase 2 or ca2 which like all carbonic anhydrase isozymes generates protons and bicarbonate from carbon dioxide and water okay so ca2 facilitates resorption pit acidification by osteoclast and urinary acidification by renal tubular epithelial cells so osteopetrosis due to ca2 mutations is therefore accompanied by renal tubular acidosis so mutations in ikbk okay so ca2 mutation has renal tubular acidosis as well okay so muca uh, mutations in ikbkg 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 so it encodes nemo the regulatory subunit of the inhibitor of kappa b kinase or ikk complex that is involved in nf kappa b activation it is a cause of osteopetrosis that is not due to defective acidification so what is not due to effective defective acidification i cabbage 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 g okay cabbage kg i cabbage kg okay nothing related with acidification so nemo which is x linked is required for osteoclastogenesis and osteoclast survival so if this nemo is not there because of mutations in i cab cabbage then uh, there is defective osteoclast survival okay which is regulated by nf kappa b and that is defective here so because nf kappa b serves many other functions ikbkg mutations result in a multi system disorder called x linked anhydrotic ectodermal dysplasia x linked anhydrotic ectodermal dysplasia with immunodeficiency that includes osteopetrosis so moving on okay moving on to the morphology 
due to deficient osteoclast activity bones involved by osteopetrosis lack a medullary canal this is important and the ends of long bones are bulbous so there is Erlenmeyer flask deformity the ends of long bones are bulbous Erlenmeyer flask deformity and misshapen okay the neural foramina are small okay the neural foramina are small and can compress the existing nerves the primary spongiosa which is normally removed during bone growth persists and fills the medullary cavity leaving no room for the hematopoietic marrow and preventing formation of mature trabeculae deposited bone is not remodeled and tends to be woven rather than lamellar because see uh, if you want lamellar bone you need to give it time what happens with time simultaneous resorption and new bone formation so if you are not giving it time if you are leaving it just like that then deposited bone is not remodeled and it is woven depending on the underlying genetic defect the number of osteoclasts may be normal increased or decreased so here you can see increased bone density okay pearly white appearance okay you don't see the normal uh, sponge uh, air gaps within the bone it is pearly white and osteopetrosis So moving on to the clinical features, severe infantile osteopetrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder that usually becomes evident in utero or soon after birth. So fractures are seen, anemia is seen because there is no bone marrow for hematopoiesis to take place. Where will you get the cells from? And also hydrocephaly are often seen resulting in postpartum mortality. Affected individuals who survive into their infancy have cranial nerve defects. Uh, so why is that? Because the cranial nerves pass through uh, foramina right bony foramina and if they're compressing the cranial nerves you get cranial nerve defects so what happens atrophy deafness and facial paralysis they're repeated often fatal infections because of leukopenia why again there is no hematopoiesis due to reduced marrow space the compensatory extramedullary hematopoiesis can lead to prominent hepatosplenomegaly autosomal dominant forms are milder and may not be detected until adolescence or adulthood when discovered on x-ray studies, either incidentally or because of repeated fractures. Osteopetrosis was the first genetic bone disease treated with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which is effective because osteoclasts are derived from hematopoietic precursors. The normal osteoclasts produced from donor stem cells reverse many of the skeletal abnormalities. And then we can move on to diseases associated with defects and degradation of macromolecules. So you have mucopolysaccharidosis. They're lysosomal storage diseases. They're caused by deficiencies in enzymes, primarily acid hydrolases that degrade dermatin sulfate, heparin sulfate, and keratin sulfate. So mesenchymal cells, particularly chondrocytes, degrade the extracellular matrix mucopolysaccharides. In these diseases, mucopolysaccharides accumulate within the chondrocytes, within the chondrocytes and induce apoptosis. Extracellular mucopolysaccharide accumulation leads to structural defects in articular cartilage. Consequently, many of the skeletal manifestations of the mucopolysaccharidosis result from abnormalities in the cartilage analage, growth plates, coastal cartilages, and articular surfaces. Affected individuals are frequently of short stature and have chest wall abnormalities and malformed bones. So moving on to the key concepts. So developmental disorders of bone and cartilage. So abnormalities in a single bone or localized group of bones are called dis uh, dysostosis and arise from defects in mesenchymal migration or condensation. So you have absent or aplasia, you can have supernumerary bones or abnormally fused bones. Okay, then you have global disorganization which is dysplasia. Uh, developmental anomalies can be categorized based on the associated gene defect. So transcription factors, you have most importantly the homeobox genes, so Hox D13, which are frequently mutated in brachydactyly. Then you have signal transduction molecules, so FGFR3 mutations in a chondroplasia and lethal variant which is thanatophoric dysplasia both of which manifest as dwarfism, of which a chondroplasia is the most common cause. Then you have structural proteins, so type 1 collagen mutation, gene mutation. You have osteogenesis imperfecta, characterized by defective bone formation and skeletal fragility. Then you have metabolic enzymes and transporters, so you have the um, mutations that interfere with osteoclast acidification of the resorption pit or osteocla osteoclastogenesis. Okay, the last one, IKBKG1, cause osteopetrosis in which bones are hard but brittle. Depending on the gene mutated, extraskeletal manifestations also may be present. Okay. Moving on to the next topic, metabolic diseases of bones. So we have two diseases, osteopenia and porosis. So penia basically means a decrease in osteo refers to bone. So penia or osteopenia refers to decreased bone mass. 
whereas osteoporosis is basically osteopenia or decreased bone mass that is severe enough to significantly increase the risk of fracture. Radiographically, osteoporosis is considered bone mass at least 2.5 standard deviations below the mean peak bone mass in young adults. So, osteopenia is 1 to 2.5 standard deviations below the mean. The disorder may be localized to a certain bone or region, as in disuse, osteoporosis of a limb, or it may involve the entire skeleton as a manifestation of metabolic bone disease. Generalized osteoporosis may be primary or secondary to a variety of conditions. Each year, approximately 1 million Americans experience an osteoporosis-related fracture with an estimated cost of more than $14 billion. So, the following discussion relates largely to these forms of osteoporosis, but before that, let us just discuss the categories of generalized osteoporosis or decreased bone mass, which is severe enough to cause fractures or less than 2.5 standard deviations from the mean. So, primary osteoporosis, you have idiopathic causes, post-menopausal, because of decreased levels of estrogen. Basically, estrogen is saving your bone, okay? And senile, okay? In secondary causes, you have endocrine disorders such as Addison's disease, type 1 diabetes mellitus, hyperparathyroidism and hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism as well. Okay, you have pituitary tumors, neoplasia, etc. GIT causes, you have vitamin D deficiency, mostly vitamin C because you need it for collagen formation, the hydroxylation of lysine residues. Okay. And then you also have malabsorption and malnutrition if you can't absorb calcium and phosphate well. And you have drugs such as alcohol, anticoagulants and other drugs such as chemotherapy drugs and corticosteroids. And miscellaneous drugs, sorry miscellaneous things, you have anemia, you have homocystinuria, you have osteogenesis imperfecta, etc. So moving on to the pathogenesis of osteoporosis. Peak bone mass is achieved during young adulthood, okay? So, its magnitude is determined largely by hereditary factors, especially polymorphisms in the genes that influence bone metabolism. So, here you can see in this figure, the pathophysiology of postmenopausal and senile osteoporosis. So, basically, peak bone mass is mostly determined by genetic factors in young age, obviously, physical activity and also nutrition to some extent. So basically what happens is, in menopause, there is decreased serum estrogen. We talked about this. There is also increased IL-1, IL-6 and tumor necrosis factor levels, IL-1, 6 and TNF-alpha. And there is also increased expression of rank and rank ligand. And we discussed this, whenever there is an interaction between rank and rank ligand, there is increased osteoclast activity resulting in resorption of bone. And senile related aging, what, what it does is basically it decreases the replicative activity of osteoprogenitor cells. Okay, old cells cannot divide as well as young cells. So, there is decreased synthetic activity of osteoblasts, decreased biological activity of matrix bound growth factors and reduced physical activity. So, menopausal uh, osteoporosis is related to osteoclast overactivity, whereas aging is related to osteoblast, hypo, uh, hypoactive osteoblast basically. Okay. So, physical activity, muscle strength, diet and hormonal state also make important contributions. Once maximal skeletal mass is attained, bone resorption slightly exceeds formation approximately after the age of 40, resulting in age-related bone loss that averages 0.7% per year. Both sexes are affected equally, but the process is more rapid on average in Caucasians than, those, than in those of African descent. Although numerous factors affect bone mass, the most common forms of osteoporosis are senile and postmenopausal. Okay, so age-related changes in, uh, include a reduced proliferative and biosynthetic capacity and attenuated response to growth factors of osteoblasts, resulting in hypoactive or diminished ability of the osteoblasts to make bone. This form of osteoporosis is known as senile osteoporosis and it is categorized as a low turnover variant. Reduced physical activity increases the rate of bone loss in experimental animals and humans because mechanical forces normally stimulate bone remodeling. You need to remember this. Mechanical forces normally stimulate bone remodeling. So, bone loss in an immobilized or paralyzed extremity or an astronaut's experience in reduced gravitational forces for prolonged periods and conversely increased bone density in athletes exemplify the importance of physical forces in bone maintenance. So, you need to remember a term you studied in general anatomy last year, which is overuse hypertrophy and disuse atrophy. So, when considering physical activity, the effect of load magnitude on bone density is greater than load repetition, explaining why resistance exercises such as weight training increase bone mass more effectively than endurance activities such as bicycling. 
the decreased physical activity that is associated with normal aging contributes to senile osteoporosis. Next, genetic factors such as single gene defects are rare causes of osteoporosis. However, polymorphisms in certain genes may contribute to variation in peak bone density within populations. The most strongly linked genes identified by genome-wide association studies include RANK, RANK ligand and OPG obviously, all of which encode key osteoclast regulators, the HLA locus for unknown reasons and the estrogen receptor gene. Okay. And also calcium nutritional state contributes to peak bone mass. Adolescent girls tend to have insufficient calcium intake in their diet. So if it occurs during a period of rapid bone growth, calcium deficiency reduces peak bone mass and increases the risk of osteoporosis. So relative deficiencies of calcium and vitamin D and elevated PTH levels may also contribute to the development of senile osteoporosis. And hormonal influences in the decade after menopause up to 2% of cortical bone and 9% of cancellous bone may be lost each year. Estrogen deficiency plays the major role in this phenomenon and close to 40% of postmenopausal women are affected by postmenopausal osteoporosis, decreased levels of estrogen. Although decreased estrogen increases bone formation and resorption, the latter dominates, resulting in high turnover osteoporosis. Estrogen loss leads to increased secretion of inflammatory cytokines such as IL-1, IL-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha by innate immune cells in the blood and marrow through unknown mechanisms. The resulting increases and decreases in rank ligand and OPG respectively. So rank ligand increases, OPG decreases uh, and this stimulates osteoclast recruitment and activity. So moving on to the morphology of uh, osteoporosis. The hallmark of osteoporosis is histologically normal bone that is decreased in quantity. So here you can see. Yeah. There is histologically normal bone. Okay. But it is decreased in quantity. Okay. Here you can see few areas the bone quantity is decreased. The entire skeleton is affected. Okay. So, but certain bones tend to be more severely impacted. Postmenopausal osteoporosis mainly affects bones or portions of bones that have increased surface area, such as the cancellous compartment of vertebral bodies. So, you have vertebral bodies, right? Okay. So, the cancellous compartment of vertebral bodies, uh, they have an increased surface area. So, those are mostly affected. The trabecular plates become perforated and thinned. You can see perforation in the trabeculae, bony trabeculae, and thinning of the trabeculae. See, it's thinning. And they lose their interconnections, leading to microfractures and eventually to vertebral collapse. Okay, so if this is thinning out, if this is collapsing, okay, then, sorry, if this is thinning out and perforating, it, it will eventually collapse. In senile osteoporosis, the cortex is thinned by subperiosteal and endosteal resorption and the haversian systems are widened okay so here you can see a normal vertebral body okay and an osteoporotic vertebral body okay sorry about the confusion earlier so here you can see thinning out and thin uh, and dilation of the spaces okay and here in advanced osteoporosis, you can see both the trabecular bone of the medulla here at the bottom and the cortical bone, okay, which are markedly thinned. Moving on to the clinical features. The clinical manifestations of osteoporosis depend on which bones are involved. Vertebral fractures that frequently occur in the thoracic and lumbar regions are painful. And when multiple can cause significant loss of height and deformities such as lumbar lordosis and kyphoscoliosis. Fraction, sorry, fractures of the femoral neck, pelvis or spine lead to immobilization and complications such as pulmonary embolism and pneumonia resulting in 40,000 to 50,000 deaths per year. Osteoporosis cannot be reliably detected in plain radiographs until 30 to 40% of bone mass is lost. The best estimates of bone loss, aside from biopsy, which is rarely performed, are specialized radiographic imaging techniques such as dual energy X-ray absorptiometry and quantitative computed tomography or quantitative CT, which uh, both of which measure bone density. So, preventive and therapeutic management of osteoporosis includes exercise, okay, appropriate calcium and vitamin D intake, and pharmacological agents, most commonly bif uh, bisphosphonates 
which reduce osteoclast activity and induce their apoptosis. So denosumab, an anti-rank-like and antibody, okay, denosumab, MAB is monoclonal antibody, MAB, okay, denosumab, which is an anti-rank-like and antibody, remember this, vitamin D is needed for bones, right, so D, eno, sumab, eno, reno, okay, renal, vitamin D also has effects on the kidney, so D, eno, sumab, okay, an anti-rank-like and antibody has shown promise in treating some forms of post-menopausal osteoporosis. Although menopausal hormone therapy has been used to prevent osteoporosis and associated fractures, complications, particularly deep vein thrombosis and stroke, have prompted search for more selective estrogen receptor modulators. Moving on to osteomalacia and rickets, there are manifestations of impaired mineralization of bone matrix. This contrasts with osteoporosis, which is in which mineralization of bone is normal, but the bone mass is quantitatively decreased. Most examples of undermineralized matrix Okay, remember this. In rickets, there is undermineralized matrix. It results from abnormal vitamin D metabolism or vitamin D deficiency. So, rickets refers to the disorder in children whereas in whom it interferes with the deposition of bone in the growth plates, whereas osteomalacia is the adult counterpart, in which bone is formed, in which bone formed during remodeling is undermineralized and predisposed to fractures. So, basically, in children, there is a di uh, d uh, interference with the deposition of bone in the growth plates. Whereas in adults, there is under-mineralization of the uh, re bone during remodeling. And then moving on to hyperparathyroidism. Remember this, parathyroid hormone increases serum calcium levels. Okay, and calcitonin decreases serum calcium. So how does that do that? Uh, parathyroid hormone resorbs the bone and removes calcium from the bone to uh, put it in the blood or serum. And then calcitonin does the ag uh, exact opposite. So... Hyperparathyroidism causes increased bone resorption. So, parathyroid hormone has a central role in calcium homeostasis through the following effect. So, it activates osteoclasts. Okay. Remember this. Uh, parathyroid hormone increases serum calcium, right? So, how does that do that? It activates osteoclasts and tell them, it tells them to resorb bone. It increases bone resorption and ca calcium mobilization. PTH... Uh, mediates the effect indirectly by increasing rank lag and expression on osteoblasts. See, this is what you need to remember. Parathyroid hormone, to increase serum calcium, it must activate osteoclasts. But how does it do that? By binding to receptors on osteoblasts. Okay, so receptors for parathyroid hormone are present on osteoblasts. Okay. Then increasing calcium resorption by the renal tubules, increasing urinary phosphate excretion and increasing synthesis of active vitamin D. So, 125 dihydroxyl, uh, dihydroxyl rated vitamin D by the kidneys, uh, thereby enhancing intestinal calcium absorption and mobilizing bone calcium by inducing rank like and expression on osteoplasts. The net result of PTH action is elevated serum calcium, which normally inhibits PTH production. So, once you have the desired effect, there is negative feedback control. Excessive or inappropriate PTH release may stem from autonomous parathyroid secretion, primary hyperparathyroidism or may be the result of renal disease which is secondary parathyroidism. In either setting, hyperparathyroidism produces changes throughout the skeleton as a consequence of unrestrained osteoclast activity. Elevated PTH is responsible for bone changes in primary hyperparathyroidism but additional factors contribute in secondary hyperparathyroidism. In chronic renal insufficiency, 125-dihydroxyl vitamin D synthesis is reduced to decreased, re reduced due to decreased alpha-1 hydroxylase activity. Alpha-1 is present in the kidney, 25 in the liver. So, first step occurs in the liver, second step, 1-hydroxylation in the kidney. So, in chronic renal insufficiency, this function is reduced, which stems from loss of renal function and the suppressive effects of hyperphosphatemia on alpha-1 hydroxylase. So, inadequate vitamin D ultimately limits intestinal calcium absorption. Secondary hyperparathyroidism can also be complicated by metabolic acidosis and aluminum deposition in the bone. With time, loss of bone mass increases susceptibility to fractures, bone deformation and joint problems. So, moving on to the morphology of hyperparathyroidism. So, symptomatic untreated primary hyperparathyroidism manifests with three interrelated skeletal abnormalities. Osteoporosis, okay, because you are resorbing bone, obviously. Brown tumors and osteitis fibrosa cystica. Osteoporosis is generalized but is most severe in the phalanges, vertebrae and proximal femur. Remember the vertebrae is affected. Okay. 
Hyper parathyroidism prominent, most prominently enhances osteoclast activity within the cortical bone, subperiosteal and endosteal surfaces. But cancellous bone can also be affected. At these sites, osteoclast may tunnel into and dissect centrally along the depth of the trabecula, leaving adjacent marrow spaces to be replaced by fibrovascular tissue, producing dissecting osteitis. So within the bony trabeculae, osteoclasts tunnel into the trabeculae centrally along the length, dissecting it lengthwise, producing dissecting osteitis because it is replaced by fibrovascular tissue. So inflammation of the bone, osteitis, which is being dissected and replaced by fibrovascular tissue lengthwise. So radiographically, dissecting osteitis is seen as decreased bone density or osteoporosis. That's it. Bone loss in hyperparathyroidism predisposes to microfractures, secondary hemorrhage, macrophage recruitment and ingrowth of reparative fibrous tissue to create a mass lesion called brown tumor. Okay, so bone loss causes uh, re uh, repairing fibrous tissue to come in and create a mass lesion called a brown tumor. So the brown color reflects vascularity, hemorrhage and hemosiderin deposition. Hemosiderin, okay. So, cystic degeneration of brown tumors is common. The combination of increased bone cell ac activity, osteoclast activity, then you have uh, fibrosis filling in the spaces. So, peritrabecular fibrosis and cystic brown tumors is the hallmark of severe hyperparathyroidism and it is known as generalized osteitis fibrosa cystica or von Recklinghausen disease of bone. Okay, von Recklinghausen disease of bone. So, the bone is wrecked. Okay, the bone is wrecked. So, osteitis fibrosa cystica is now uncommon because hyperparathyroidism is usually diagnosed on routine blood tests and treated at an early age. Although secondary hyperparathyroidism can cause similar changes, the process is usually less severe and skeletal abnormalities uh, tend to be milder. Bony changes regress or disappear completely when hyperparathyroidism is controlled. Moving on to renal osteodystrophy. The term renal osteodystrophy describes the collective skeletal changes that occur in chronic renal disease including those affect associated with dialysis. Okay, but before that let us just look at these figures. Here you can see hyperparathyroidism with osteoclast boring into the center of the trabeculum. Okay, dissecting osteitis. This is the center of the bony trabeculae. Okay, you can see osteoclast dissecting here. Okay. And then you can see a resected rib here harboring an expansile brown tumor adjacent to the coastal cartilage. Okay. So yeah, renal osteodystrophy, it describes the collective skeletal changes that occur in chronic renal disease, including those associated with dialysis. The manifestations include many of the entities described earlier, including osteopenia or osteoporosis, osteomalacia, secondary hyperparathyroidism and growth retardation. As medical advances have prolonged the lives of individuals with renal disease, the impact of this disease on skeletal homeostasis has assumed greater clinical importance. Histological bone changes in individuals with end-stage renal failure can be divided into three major types of disorders. High turnover osteodystrophy, which is characterized by increased bone resorption and bone formation with the former predominating. Okay, that is why there is dystrophy. So high turnover osteodystrophy. Low turnover or aplastic disease is manifested by adynamic bone, little osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity and less commonly osteomalacia and mixed pattern disease with areas of high turnover and low turnover. So what is the pathogenesis? Kidney disease causes skeletal abnormalities to three mechanisms. What are those three mechanisms? Tubular dysfunction. So uh, tubular dysfunction most commonly leads to renal tubular acidosis. So what happens in acidosis? Acidosis dissolves hydroxyapatite, results in matrix demineralization and osteomalacia. Okay. Then secondary hyperparathyroidism due to reduced phosphate excretion, there is chronic hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia. Okay. As discussed earlier, the resulting metabolic state is not completely analogous to primary hyperparathyroidism and bone volume turnover mineralization can vary dependently independently and then there is decreased biosynthetic function including reduced renal vitamin d hydroxylation to generate 125 dihydroxy vitamin d3 so this results in uh, hypocalcemia that contributes to secondary hyperparathyroidism a hormonal feedback loop between kidney and bone that regulates calcium and phosphate homeostasis involves the secreted proteins 
BMP7 and fibroglo fibroblast growth factor 23, BMP7, FGF23, and the membrane protein clotho. Okay, remember this. BMP7, FGF23, and clotho. So BMP7 produced by renal tubular cells induces osteoblast differentiation and proliferation, whereas FGF23 acts on the kidney to regulate clotho-dependent renal phosphate homeostasis and vitamin D hydroxylation. So chronic renal failure disrupts the signaling axis and contributes to osteopenia and osteomalacia. Okay, so here you can see the mechanisms of renal osteodystrophy, which involve homeostasis and endocrine signaling between both and bone and kidney. So basically, renal tubular acidosis Ca uh, it causes increased uh, bone resorption because of dis uh, dissol increased dissolution of ca calcium hydroxyapatite. Okay, so that is how acidosis functions. So what happens then? Again, in renal failure, there is reduced renal uh, hydroxylation of vitamin D. So again, that impacts bone. And again, increased phosphate levels, they cause hy uh, hypocalcemia. Hyperphosphatemia causes hypocalcemia. So how does this work at the molecular level? So there is a decrease in renal synthesis of BMP7 protein. Okay, so it, there is no uh, stimulation of osteoblast activity. At the same time, there is, uh, an, uh, there is uh, basically a decrease in fibroblast growth factor 23, FGF23, which decreases clotho, which is a membrane protein. Okay, so this membrane protein clotho regulates renal phosphate homeostasis. So moving on to the key concepts, osteopenia and porosis are conditions in which bone is normally mineralized but decreased in quantity only. Osteoporosis is defined as bone loss sufficient to increase fracture risk and is associated with significant morbidity and mortality from fractures. Multiple fractures, uh, factors including peak bone mass, age, activity, genetics, nutrition, and hormonal influences contribute to its pathogenesis. Osteomalacia is defined by the presence of bone that is insufficiently mineralized. In the developing skeleton, this results in rickets. Hyperparathyroidism arises from either autonomous or compensatory hypersecretion of PTH and can lead to osteoporosis, brown tumors, and osteitis fibrosa cystica. In high-income countries where early diagnosis is the norm, these manifestations are rare. Renal osteodystrophy is marked by constellation of bone abnormalities uh, such, uh, such as osteopenia, malacia, hyperparathyroidism, and growth retardation that occur as a consequence of chronic renal failure. The bone changes stem from decreased tubular, glomerular, and hormonal renal functions. Moving on to Paget's disease of bone, so, which is osteitis deformance. The so Paget disease is a disorder marked by increased but disordered and structurally unsound bone mass. There is increased bone mass but disordered bone mass and it is structurally unsound. It develops in three sequential phases, an initial osteolytic stage, a mixed osteoclastic osteoblastic stage and a burned out quiescent osteosclerotic stage in which osteoblast activity predominates. First osteoclast dominate, then you have both, okay, and then you have osteoblast. Paget disease often presents in late adulthood and becomes progressively more common with increasing age. Uh, increasing age. So an in intriguing aspect is the striking geographic variation in its prevalence. It is relatively common in Caucasians in England, France, Austria, regions of Germany, Australia, New Zealand and the US and it is rare in native populations of Scandinavia, China, Japan and Africa. So here you can see a diagrammatic representation of Paget disease of bone demonstrating the three phases of disease evolution. So in the first stage you have osteolytic it is the osteolytic phase in which the osteoclasts predominate. Here you can see the osteoclasts. Then you can see a mixed phase with both cells, osteoclasts as well as osteoblasts. There is newborn formation as well as resorption. And then osteoblasts dominate in the final osteosclerotic phase. Here you can see the growth changes in the bone as well. The marrow is almost empty. And then uh, finally bone is uh, laid down in the final stages. So the exact instance is difficult to determine because many affected individuals are asymptomatic. It is estimated that 1% of the US population older than 40 years of age is affected. The prevalence in England is 2.5% for men and 1.6% for women below the age of, sorry, above the age of 55 years. A decrease in new cases has been observed in some countries over the past 30 years. Moving on to the pathogenesis, the cause of Paget's disease remains uncertain. But current evidence suggests that both genetic and environmental contributions are there. Approximately 50% of cases of familial Paget's disease and 10% of sporadic cases are associated with mutations in the SQS-TM1 gene. Okay. 
S Q S T M one gene. Remember it as Paget's disease. Sequester me. Sequester me. Okay. Paget's disease. You need pages to write the exam, right? As a medical student, you write a lot of exams. So pages, you need pages, right? So sequester pages, Paget's disease of bone, sequester me, SQSTM1 gene mutations that increase NF kappa B activity and thus enhance the osteoclast activity. Activating rank mutations and inactivating OBG mutations account for some cases of juvenile Paget disease. In vitro studies suggest that chronic infection of osteoclast precursors by measles or other RNA viruses may also play a role. So Paget disease shows remarkable histological variation over time and across sites. Its hallmark is a mosaic pattern of lamellar bone. Remember this. As soon as you hear Paget's disease, remember you need to sequester pages. So SQSTM1 gene mutations as well as you know mutations in rank and OPG. At the same time, there is a mosaic pattern of lamellar bone that develops in the sclerotic phase. So there are three phases, right? Osteoclastic osteolytic phase and then mixed phase and osteoblastic osteosclerotic phase fibrosclerotic or whatever so this jigsaw puzzle like appearance okay see you can see a jigsaw puzzle like appearance okay pieces of a jigsaw puzzle so there is a mosaic pattern of lamellar bone you can see the lamellae right it is not as cellular as weapon bone but it is mosaic in pattern so the jigsaw puzzle appearance is produced by unusually prominent cement lines which join half hazardly united oriented units of lamellar bone. You can see these cement lines. Okay. And then the features are less specific and uh, or during other phases of disease, but include waves of osteoclastic activity and numerous resorption pits in the lytic phase. The osteoclasts are abnormally large and have many more than the normal 10 to 12 nuclei. Sometimes 100 nuclei are present. Osteoclasts persist in the mixed phase, but many of the bone surfaces are also lined by plump osteoblasts. The marrow adjacent to the bone forming surface is replaced by loose connective tissue that contains osteoprogenitor cells and numerous blood vessels. The newly formed bone may be woven or lamellar, but eventually it is all remodeled into lamellar bone. As the mosaic pattern takes hold and cell activity decreases, periosseous fibrovascular tissue recedes and is replaced by normal marrow. In the end, the coarsely thickened trabeculae and soft and porous corticals lack structural stability and make the bone vulnerable to fractures. So what are the clinical features? The clinical findings are extremely variable and depend on the extent and site of the disease. Paget disease is monostotic in about 15% of cases and polyostotic in the remainder. The axial skeleton or proximal femur is involved in up to 80% of cases. Most cases are asymptomatic and are discovered as an incidental radiographic finding. Pain localized uh, pain localized to the affected bone may be present uh, due to microfractures or bone overgrowth that compresses spinal and cranial nerve roots. Enlargement of the craniofacial skeleton may produce leon, leontiasis osia, lion face, so lionine facies and a cranium so heavy that it is difficult for the person to hold the head erect. The weak uh, sorry, the weakened pagetic bone may lead to the invagination of the skull base, so platybasia, and compression of the posterior fossa. So weight bearing causes anterior bowing of the femurs and tibia and distorts the femoral heads, resulting in the development of severe secondary osteoarthritis. So basically, it is difficult to hold your head, okay, or like a lion, right? A lion doesn't hold its head vertically, okay? So like this, difficult to hold your head because skull uh, mass increases. Uh, skull weight increases and then uh, because it is difficult to hold your head up there is a uh, kind of a falling of the weight uh, downwards right because of gravity so there is posterior fossa compression okay there is platybasia so invagination of the skull base lionine facies and then compression of the nerve roots causing pain localized to the affected bone and then uh, anterior bowing okay which causes secondary osteoarthritis of the weight bearing bone such as the femur and then chalk stick type fractures are common and usually involve the long bones of the lower extremities vertebral compression fractures uh, can result in spinal cord injury and kyphosis so rarely hypervascularity so spinal cord injury and kyphosis rarely hypervascularity of pagetic bone warms the overlying skin and in severe, severe polyostatic disease the increased blood flow can act as an arteriovenous shunt leading to high output heart failure or exacerbation of the underlying cardiac disease. The most dreaded complication of Paget disease is sarcoma. 
which occurs in less than 1% of all individuals with Paget disease and 5 to 10% of those with severe polyosteotic disease. The sarcoma, usually osteosarcoma or fibrosarcoma, arise in Paget lesions in the long bones, pelvis, skull and spine. The diagnosis can be made radiographically, so it is typically enlarged with thick, coarse and cortis and sand medulla, as you can see in this figure. There is uh, enlarged, uh, see first there is bowing of the weight bearing bones and then the affected portion is en uh, enlarged and sclerotic as you can see. It is enlarged and sclerotic and it exhibits irregular thickening of cortical and cancellous bone. Active disease has a wedge shaped li lytic leading edge that may progress along the length of the bone at a rate of 1 cm per year. So many affected individuals have elevated serum alkaline phosphatase levels because alkaline phosphatase wants bone to you know perform properly. So ALP is increased but serum calcium and phosphate levels are normal. In the absence of malignant transformation, Paget disease is usually not serious or life threatening. Most affected individuals have mild symptoms that are readily suppressed by treatment with calcitonin and bisphosphonates. Okay. Moving on to fractures. Fractures are defined as loss of bone integrity. They are some of the most common pathological conditions affecting bones and there are different types of fractures. So basically, if you look at a fracture, first you have skin and then you have beneath it, under some structures, under some muscles, you have finally the bone. Okay, so when the overlying skin is intact but the bone integrity is lost, it is a simple fracture. But it is a compound fracture when the bone communicates with the skin surface. Okay, it is a comminuted fracture. If the bone is fragmented, it is a displaced fracture if the ends of the bone at the fracture site are not aligned. So if this is the fracture site and the ends are not aligned, it is a displaced fracture. Stress. So a slowly developing fracture that follows a period of increased physical activity in which the bone is subjected to repetitive load. So if you take a bone for example, okay, okay, if the bone is subjected to increased loads, finally, 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 if it results in a fracture, it is a stress fracture. And then you have green strict fractures which extend only partially through the bone common in infants when the bones are soft. So in infants when the bones are especially soft, it, is a, it extends only partially through the bone. Okay, if this is the entire bone. So that is a green strict fracture. Next you also have pathological fractures which involve bone weakened by an underlying disease process such as a tumour. Okay, so moving on to the healing of fractures. So the bone integrity is lost, in, uh, is uh, disrupted in a fracture. So they need to heal, right? So bone has a remarkable capacity for repair. This process involves regulated expression of a multitude of genes and can be separated into overlapping stages. Immediately after fracture, rupture of blood vessels results in a hematoma that fills and surrounds the area of injury. So as you can see in this figure right here, so immediately when here you can see there is a fracture. So in, you know that there is a nutrient artery which runs through the uh, bone. So rupture of that artery results in extravasation of blood which forms a hematoma, okay. There is an organizing hematoma on day 0 to 1. The clot provides fibrin mesh that seals the fracture site and provides a framework for the inflammatory cell influx, fibroblast ingrowth and capillary proliferation that characterize granulation tissue. So release of platelet derived growth factor TGF beta, FGF and other growth factors by degranulated platelets and inflammatory cells activates osteoprogenitor cells in the periosteum, medullary cavity and surrounding soft tissues to stimulate osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity. So first there is disruption of the bone, nutrient artery uh, blood is uh, extravasating into the uh, nearby space so it forms a hematoma, hematoma then clots and it causes a fibrin meshwork and in this fibrin meshwork you have inflammatory cells that are coming in, you have platelets that are coming in in the clot, they are releasing platelet derived growth factors, the inflammatory cells are also releasing TGF beta and FGF, okay. So then the inflammatory cells are also activating osteoprogenitor cells in the periosteum, so in the periosteum here you have osteoprogenitor cells, they are activating, osteoblast and osteoclast activity is activated or stimulated, okay. So uncalcified tissue is known as soft tissue callus or procallus forms. And uh, these soft tissue calluses or procalluses, they provide some anchorage but not structural rigidity for weight bearing. Within two weeks of injury, the activated osteoprogenitor cells deposit subperiosteal trabeculae of woven bone oriented perpendicular to the cortical axis and within the medullary cavity. 
So these osteoprogenitor cells, which I was talking about, they orient perpendicular to the cortical bone, okay, and they deposit subperiosteal. So th this is the periosteum, right? They deposit subperiosteal trabeculae. Okay, subperiosteal trabeculae of woven bone oriented perpendicular to the cortical axis. This is a cortex, sorry, periosteum in the cortex. So they deposit subperiosteally the trabeculae, okay, osteoprogenitor cells. These processes transform the procallus into a bony callus, which reaches maximal girth at the end of the second or third week and helps stabilize the fracture site. Activated soft tissue mesenchymal cells may also differentiate into chondrocytes that produce fibrocartilage and hyaline cartilage. Endochondral ossification creates a continuous network of bone and newly deposited bone trabeculae in the medulla and beneath the periosteum. As a result, fractured bone ends are bridged and with progressive mineralization, the stiffness and strength of the callus increases to allow weight bearing. In the early stages of callus formation, excess fibrous tissue, cartilage and woven bone is produced. The portions that are not subjected to physical stress are resorbed as the callus matures, which both reduces the size of the healing bone and creates lamellar bone. The healing process is completed by restoration of the medullary cavity because you need hematopoiesis to take place, right? So in children and young adults, near perfect union is the norm. Although some deformity typically persists after healing of displaced and comminuted fractures. In older adults, fractures often occur in the background of other bone disorders such as osteoporosis and osteomalacia. In such settings, surgical immobilization is often needed for adequate repair. Other factors may also interfere with healing. Inadequate immobilization which permits movement of the callus and interferes with normal maturation can result in delayed union or non-union. If non-union persists, the malformed callus undergoes cystic degeneration and the luminal surface can become lined by synovial-like cells creating a false joint or pseudoarthrosis. Infection of the fracture site, especially common in open fractures, is another serious obstacle to healing as are malnutrition and skeletal dysplasia. So here you can see the reaction to fracture which begins with an organizing hematoma on zero to, uh, day 0 to day 1. Okay, So this lays down a fibrin network and the platelets which come in, uh, they uh, leakage from the platelets, it, it releases FGF and uh, platelet derived growth factor etc. Inflammatory cells also get into that fibrin meshwork as you can see here. So this all is a fibrin meshwork. Okay, so platelets, as you can see here, and inflammatory cells, they are coming into the meshwork and they are releasing platelet derived growth factor TGF beta and FGF. Okay, and then these uh, growth factors are activating progenitor cells and they are causing chondrocyte differentiation, which again leads to uh, both resorption and activation of osteoblasts and both osteoclasts. So, indirectly, zero, day, day 0 to 1, organizing hematoma, 0 to 2 weeks, you have a soft callus formation. And then two to three weeks, you have a bony callus formation. And finally, three weeks to months, you have a bony callus that is formed. Okay, lamellar bone. In the bony callus, you basically have woven bone. Okay, woven bone is slowly replaced by lamellar bone. Moving on to osteonecrosis. So, infarction of bone and marrow is relatively common. It can be limited to the medullary cavity or it can involve both the medulla and the cortex. So, fractures and corticosteroid administration are the two most common causes of avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis. What are they? So, fractures and corticosteroid administration. But many other conditions also predispose to osteonecrosis including alcohol abuse, bisphosphonate therapy, uh, connective tissue disease, chronic pancreatitis, gaucher disease, pregnancy, radiation therapy, sickle cell crisis and dysparism or decompression sickness. So, what is, what is the morphology? So, medullary infarcts are geographic in shape and involve both trabecular bone and marrow. So, collateral blood flow usually limits the cortical involvement. In subchondral infarcts, a triangular or wedge-shaped segment with the subchondral bone plate uh, as its base undergoes necrosis. The overlying articular cartilage remains viable due to nutrients within the synovial fluid. So if you see here, medullary infarcts, if you take the bone and this is the uh, cap nutrient artery running through the medulla. So basically medullary infarcts are geographic in shape. They involve both the trabecular bone as well as the marrow. See, the marrow is obviously involved and also the trabecular bone because the nutrient artery supplies this part of the bone. In subchondral infarcts, a triangular, if this is the bone, this is subchondral infarct, a triangular or wedge-shaped segment, okay, with the subchondral bone plates as its base, it undergoes necrosis. The overlying articular cartilage remains viable due to nutrients within the synovial fluid. So you have synovial fluid on the uh, in the cartilage here and this provides nutrients here. 
to the cartilage. Microscopically, dead bone is characterized by empty lacunae surrounded by necrotic adipocytes. The released fatty acids bind calcium and form inf- insoluble calcium soaps. The remaining trabeculae act as a scaffolding for deposition of new bone, while osteoclasts resorb necrotic trabeculae. The slow pace of substitution in subchondral infarcts results in collapse of necrotic bone, fracture and sloughing of the articular cartilage. So basically, there is uh, necrosis of the bone, sloughing of the necrosed bone and then uh, sloughing of the articular cartilage. Okay, there is also uh, so necrosis, fracture of bone and uh, sloughing off of the cartilage. Uh, here you can see the femoral head with the subchondral wedge shaped pale area. Here you can see the pale area which is wedge shaped. Okay, the base is towards the periosteal surface. Okay. And the space between the overlying articular cartilage and bone is caused by trabecular compression fractures without repair. So you can see the space right here. So what are the clinical features of avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis? Symptoms depend on location and extent of infarction. Typically subchondral infarcts cause pain that is initially associated with activity but becomes constant as secondary changes supervene. Subchondral infarcts often collapse, resulting in secondary osteoarthritis and medullary infarcts are usually small and clinically silent. Moving on to osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis denotes inflammation of the bone and marrow virtually always secondary to infection. Osteomyelitis frequently manifests as a primary solitary focus of disease, but can also become a complication of any systemic infection. All types of organisms including viruses, parasites, fungi and bacteria can produce osteomyelitis but certain pyogenic bacteria and mycobacteria are the most common culprits. What are they? Pyogenic bacteria and mycobacteria. So in the US, unusual infections in immigrants from lower income countries and opportunistic infections in immunosuppressed individuals have made diagnosis and treatment of osteomyelitis challenging. So basically you need to remember that it is a primary solitary focus of disease. Okay, and it is uh, caused by certain pyogenic bacteria and mycobacteria. Uh, So, pyogenic osteomyelitis is almost always caused by bacterial infection. So, organisms may reach the bone by hematogenous spread, extension from a contiguous site or direct implantation. So, if basically you have the bone here, you have uh, nutrient artery, right? So, you can have infection from the blood, you can have infection because of trauma or extension from a contiguous site. So, there is... Uh, if there is any muscular abscess or any contiguous site infection, so extension can happen. In other words, healthy children, osteomyelitis is most often due to hematogenous spread and involves the long bones. The initiating bacteremia may stem from seemingly trivial mucosal injuries such as may occur during defecation or vigorous chewing of hard foods or from minor skin infections. In adults, osteomyelitis more often occurs as a complication of open fractures surgical procedures and infections of the feet in the setting of diabetes. So osteomyelitis is particularly worrisome in infants in whom epiphyseal infection can spread to a joint resulting in septic or suppurative arthritis, articular cartilage destruction and permanent disability. So in children basically if this is a joint the infection can spread to the joint it can infect the joint lead to suppurative arthritis okay and cause permanent disability. And moving on to Staphylococcus aureus, it is responsible for 80 to 90% of culture positive pyogenic osteomyelitis. Bacterial cell wall proteins bind to bone matrix components such as collagen, which facilitates adherence to bone. So, if this is Staph aureus, so it has a cell wall, right? So, this cell wall binds to uh, bone matrix components. Here you have bone matrix such as collagen. Okay, let us see the triple helical structure. Okay which facilitates adherence to bone. So, E. coli, Pseudomonas and Klebsiella are more frequently isolated from individuals with genitourinary tract infections or intravenous drug users. Mixed bacterial infections typically reflect direct spread or inoculation during surgery or in open fractures. Haemophilus influenza and group B streptococci are common in neonates and sickle cell disease predisposes to salmonella infection. No specific organism is identified in nearly 50% of patients. The location of bone infections is influenced by the osseous vascular circulation which varies with age. In neonates, metaphyseal vessels penetrate the growth plate, resulting in frequent infection of the metaphyses, epiphyses or both. 
In older children, involvement of the metaphysis is typical. The epiphysis and subchondral regions are more commonly involved in adults after a growth plate closure in which a merger of metaphysial and epiphysial vessels provides a route for bacterial spread. So, osteovascular circulation, it varies with age. In neonates, basically, metaphysial vessels, they penetrate the growth plate. So, if this is the growth plate, this is the bone, okay. Metaph you have vessels in the metaphysis, right? They penetrate the growth plate resulting in frequent infection of the metaphysis or epiphysis or both. But uh, the epiphysis and subchondral regions are most more commonly involved in adults because after growth plate closure, it merges the metaphysis and epiphysis. So moving on to the morphology, changes associated with osteomyelitis vary temporary, temporally and by location. In the acute phase, bacteria proliferate and recruit neutrophils to the site. Okay, so in osteomyelitis, itis is inflammation, right? So in the acute phase, you have uh, uh, acute phase reacted, so you have neutrophils there. Necrosis of the bone cells and marrow ensues within 48 hours. Bacteria and the associated inflammatory response then spread longitudinally because of necrosed marrow and bone. They spread longitudinally and access the haversian systems to reach the periosteum. Okay, so nutrient artery is centrally located, so they extravasate. As the marrow necrosis, they reach the periosteum. Okay, all these inflammatory cells. Because the periosteum is loosely attached to the cortex in children, subperiosteal abscess may form and extend for long distances. Associated periosteal lifting further impairs blood supply and contributes to the necrosis. Soft tissue abscesses may also form after periosteal rupture and these can channel to the skin and drain as draining sinuses. Okay, so soft tissue abscesses may also form after the periosteal rupture. First, you can have a periosteal, subperiosteal abscess. If it ruptures, you can have a soft tissue abscess and then they can channel to the skin as draining sinuses. So dead bone or sequestrum can crumble and release fragments into the sinus tract. As the inflammatory process evolves, chronic inflammatory cells recruited within the first week release cytokines that stimulate bone resorption, fibrous tissue ingrowth and peripheral deposition of reactive bone. This new bone can form a living shell or involucrum. Okay, dead bone is sequestrum. New bone which forms a living shell is involucrum around the devitalized infected bone. Okay. So here you can see a resected femur in a person with draining osteomyelitis. The drainage tract in the subperiosteal shell of viable newborn, you can see the involucrum re which reveals the inner native necrotic cortex. So here you can see the involucrum which forms a shell and here you can see already the necrotic cortex, okay, which is the sequestrum. So what are the clinical features? Hematogenous osteomyelitis may present acutely as a systemic illness with malaise, fever, chills, leukocytosis and intense throbbing pain over the infected bone. In other instances, the presentation is subtle with only unexplained fever or localized pain. Unexplained fever in infants and pain in adults. The characteristic radiographic finding of a lytic focus of bone destruction surrounded by sclerosis strongly suggests osteomyelitis. Bone cultures can be positive before treatment, but biopsy and bone cultures are required to identify the pathogen in most instances. The combination of antibiotics and surgical drainage is usually curative. Acute osteomyelitis fails to resolve and persists as a chronic infection in 5-25% to of cases. These are typically associated with delayed diagnosis, extensive bone necrosis, inadequate antibiotic therapy or surgical debridement, or weakened host defenses. Chronic infections may be punctuated by spontaneous flares that may occur after years of dormancy. Other complications of chronic osteomyelitis include pathological fracture, secondary amyloidosis, endocarditis, and sepsis. Moving on to myco mycobacterial osteomyelitis. So it tends to be more destructive and resistant to control than pyogenic osteomyelitis. So it was previously limited to lower income countries, but the incidence has risen worldwide due to immigration and increased numbers of immunocompromised individuals. So risk of mycobacterial osteomyelitis is also increased in those with pulmonary or extra pulmonary tuberculosis, up to 3% of whom have osseous infection. The infection may persist for years before diagnosis and typically presents with localized pain, low grade fever, chills or weight loss. Infection is usually solitary in immunocompetent patients but can disseminate in the immunocompromised. Mycobacteria are usually bloodborne and originate from a focus of active visceral disease during the initial stages of primary infection. Bone involvement may occur by direct extension, that is from a pulmonary focus into a rib or from tracheobronchial nodes into adjacent vertebrae or following spread via blood vessels and lymphatics. So the histological findings of granulomatous inflammation and caseous necrosis are typical of tuberculosis. 40% of mycobacterial osteomyelitis cases involve the spine, pod disease. 
So infection breaks through intervertebral discs to involve multiple vertebrae and surrounding soft tissues. Discs and vertebral destruction result in compression fractures that culminate in scoliosis, kyphosis and neurological deficits. Tuberculous osteomyelitis may also cause tuberculous arthritis, sinus tract formation, psoas abscess and amyloidosis. And finally skeletal syphilis. So syphilis, treponema pallidum and eos, treponema pertenue can involve bone. So although syphilis incidence is increasing, bone involvement remains rare because diagnosis and treatment typically occur before bone involvement develops in syphilis. In congenital syphilis, bone lesions appear in the fifth month of gestation and are fully developed at birth. The spirochetes concentrate, concentrate at sites of active endochondral ossification and within the periosteum to cause osteochondritis and periostitis. So the characteristic saber shin, okay, remember this saber shin is produced by reactive periosteal bone deposition on the medial and anterior surfaces of the tibia. Okay, so if you see a saber shin on the tibia, okay, especially on the medial and anterior surfaces. Okay, medial and anterior surfaces then it is obviously syphilis of the bone okay congenital syphilis of the bone because these spirochetes they concentrate sites of active endochondral ossification so basically in the bone you have the cartilage here so endochondritis and the periostritis so you have the perichondrium right so periostritis so in acquired syphilis bone disease begins early in the tertiary stage usually two to five years after the initial infection bones of the nose palate, skull and extremities, typically the long tubular bones such as the tibia, saber shin, okay, medial and anterior surfaces of the tibia are affected. So they are involved most frequently. So moving on to the morphology, spirochetes can be detected with silver stains or by immunohistochemistry. So edematous granulation tissue with numerous uh, plasma cells and necrotic bone characterizes syphilitic bone disease. So you use silver stains for spirochetes, okay, treponema especially. And then edematous granulation tissue with numerous plasma cells and necrotic bone uh, characterizes syphilitic bone disease. And then uh, obliterative end arthritis typically accompanies caseous necrosis as part of gammas which may be present in congenital or acquired syphilis. Moving on to the final part of this chapter which is about bone tumors and tumor like lesions. So primary bone tumors are rare and are vastly outnumbered by metastases and hypo hematopoietic tumors. So nevertheless, the dismal survival of only 50% and disfiguring surgery often required for treatment make management of bone malignancies challenging. Therapy for the 2,400 approximately new bone sarcomas diagnosed each year in the US aims to optimize survival and maintain function of affected body parts. Most bone neoplasms have a propensity for the long bones of the extremities. So the, the age groups and the anatomic sites affected are typical of specific tumor types. For example, osteosarcoma incidence peaks during adolescence and most frequently involves the knee. In contrast, chondrosarcoma affects the pelvis and proximal extremities of older adults. Benign bone tumors are often asymptomatic and identified incidentally. Others, however, produce pain, cause a slow-growing mass or produce a pathologic fracture. Radiological imaging defines tumor location and can also detect features that narrow the differential diagnosis, but biopsy is necessary for definitive diagnosis in almost all cases. Bone tumors are classified according to the normal cell types recapitulated or matrix produced. Lesions that do not have normal tissue counterparts are grouped according to clinical pathological features. So after exclusion of hematopoietic neoplasms, the most common primary bone cancers are osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. Okay, so let us just look at the classification of major non-hematopoietic primary bone tumors. So first we have cartilage forming, 40% uh, of them are cartilage forming tumors. So benign you have osteochondroma, chondroma and chondroblastoma. Okay, so osteochondroblastoma. Okay. And then you also have chondromyxoid fibroma and the malignant condition you have chondrosarcoma which is conventional. Then bone forming 32% you have osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma which are benign and osteosarcoma which is conventionally malignant. Unknown origin you have giant cell tumor and aneurysmal bone cysts which is benign and Ewing sarcoma which is malignant and ad uh, adamantioma which is also malignant. Okay unknown origin and notochordal you have chondroma which is malignant. So bone forming tumors, you have tumors in this category which produce unmineralized osteoid or mineralized woven bone. So it can either be an unmineralized osteoid or even if it is mineralized, it can be a woven bone, not lamellar. So 
osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma are benign bone producing tumors with similar histological features but different sizes sites of origin and symptoms malignant transformation is rare they are benign by definition osteoid osteomas are less than 2 cm in diameter they are most common in young men in their teens and 20s and have a predilection for the appendicular skeleton with about 50% involving the cortex of the femur or tibia a thick rim of reactive cortical bone may be the only radiographic clue despite their small size osteoid osteomas present with severe nocturnal pain that is probably caused by prostaglandin e2 so pg e2 pg e2 maintains fever okay remember this from inflammation and also pain fever and pain prostaglandin e2 so nocturnal pain of osteoid osteoma Uh, it is produced by the proliferating osteoblasts and it is relieved by aspirin and other NSAIDs so osteoblastomas are larger than 2 cm typically involve the posterior spine uh, not the uh, appendicular skeleton the axial skeleton the posterior spine and they cause pain that is unresponsive to aspirin and do not induce reactive cortical bone okay a thin rim of reactive cortical bone is seen in osteoid osteoma and it might be the only radiographic clue but in, that is not seen in osteoblastoma So osteoid osteoma can be treated by radio frequency ablation but osteoblastoma usually requires keratage or end block excision. Okay so based on 2 cm so 2 cm less than and greater uh, uh, greater than okay. And then you have um thin rim of reactive cortex reactive cortex cortex and that is absent. Okay at the same time you have and said pain pain despite inside okay so basically those are the things and appendicular skeleton posterior spine okay next Uh, osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma are round to oval well circumscribed masses of hemorrhagic gritty tan tissue microscopic examination demonstrates randomly interconnected trabeculae of woven bone rimmed by a single layer of prominent osteoblasts and surrounded by loose connective tissue with many dilated and congested capillaries the relatively small size well defined margins and benign cytological features of the neoplastic osteoblasts help distinguish these tumors from osteosarcoma reactive bone encircles the actual neoplasm or nidus which forms a small radio lucent core that may be centrally mineralized so here you can see a specimen radiograph of intracortical osteoid osteoma so the round radio lucency here with central mineralization represents the lesion and is surrounded by abundant reactive bone here you can see abundant reactive bone that has massively thickened the cortex so osteosarcoma so it is the most common primary malignant tumor of bone and accounts for approximately 20% of bone cancers the age distribution is bimodal with 75% occurring before 20 years of age a smaller peak occurs in older adults whom uh, in whom it is frequently associated with predisposing conditions such as paget disease bone infarcts and prior radiations sometimes called secondary osteosarcomas so basically it has a bimodal age distribution so below 20 years of age and a smaller peak in adults okay so below 20 years smaller peak in old age okay so men are affected slightly more than women so 1.6 is to 1 and although bo- any bone can be involved tumors usually arise in the metaphyseal region of the long bones almost 50% are near the knee in the distal femur or proximal tibia so osteosarcoma is often present with pain sometimes due to pathological features so radiographically the enlarging tumor forms a destructive mixed lytic and blastic mass with infiltrative margins the tumor frequently breaks through the cortex and lifts the periosteum inducing reactive periosteal bone formation the triangular shadow between the cortex and raised periosteal ends known radiographically as codman triangle indicates an aggressive tumor okay so here in this figure you can see 
distal femoral sarcoma with prominent bone formation extending to the soft tissues okay it has infiltrated the cortex and it is extending to the soft tissues the periosteum has been lifted okay you can see it has been lifted and uh, has laid down a proximal triangular shell of reactive bone known as cordman triangle so let me just erase that here so you can see a cordman triangle here okay the white arrow all right So moving on to the pathogenesis, so the peak incidence of osteosarcoma is uh, during the adolescent growth spurt. The tumor most occurs, occurs most frequently in the growth plate of rapidly growing bones where increased proliferation may predispose to mutations that drive oncogenesis. Approximately 70% of osteosarcomas have acquired genetic abnormalities including chromosomal aberrations. These are usually associated with mutations in well-known tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes including the following so retinoblastoma mutations rbb for bone okay osteosarcoma rb mutations are present in up to 70 percent of sporadic osteosarcomas germline rb mutations confer a thousand fold increased risk and then tp53 obviously okay so it is mutated in the germline of individuals with lee fraumeni syndrome okay who have a greater greatly increased incidence of osteosarcoma so lee fraumeni syndrome okay tp53 TP Lee Fraumeni Fraumeni okay so T Lee okay T uh, Lee Fraumeni syndrome so there's a greatly increased incidence of osteosarcoma so abnormalities that interfere with P53 function are common in sporadic osteosarcoma then you have CDK and 2A also known as INC 4A which encodes two tumor suppressors P16 and P14 it is inactivated in many osteosarcomas and MDM2 and CDK4 which inhibit P53 and RB function respectively are overexpressed in many low-grade osteosarcomas, often through chromosomal amplification of region 12Q13 to Q15. So here you can see the Cordman triangle. Okay, and morphologically, osteosarcomas are bulky, gritty, grey-white tumors that often contain hemorrhage and cystic degeneration. The tumor frequently destroys the surrounding cortices to produce soft tissue masses spread extensively in the medullary canal and replace hematopoietic marrow. So tumors infrequently penetrate the epiphyseal plate or enter the joint where they may grow along te uh, tendo ligamentous structures or through the attachment site of the joint capsule. So osteosarcomas demonstrate pleomorphism, large hyperchromatic nuclei, bizarre tumor giant cells and abundant mitosis because it is a malignant tumor. So these abundant mitoses including normal tripolar forms, so abnormal tripolar forms. So extensive necrosis and intravascular invasion are also common. Diagnosis of osteosarcoma requires the presence of malignant tumor cells producing unmineralized osteoid or mineralized woven bone, which is typically fine and lace-like but can also form broad sheets or primitive trabeculae. Neoplastic cells can also produce cartilage if abundant such tumors are classified as chondroblastic osteosarcoma. Based on their known natural history, all osteosarcoma patients are assumed to have occult metastasis at the time of diagnosis. As a result, treatment generally includes neoadjuvant th chemotherapy, surgery and post-operative adjuvant chemotherapy. Chemotherapy has greatly increased or improved osteosarcoma prognosis with 5-year survival reaching 70% in individuals without overt metastasis at initial diagnosis. Osteosarcoma metastasis sorry metastasizes hematogenously to the lungs bones brain and other sites so the outcome for those with clinically evident metastasis recurrent disease or secondary osteosarcoma remains guarded with a five-year survival rate less than 20 percent so here you can see osteosarcoma of the proximal tibia it is generally occurring near the knee okay remember that so the tan white tumor gritty gray tan white tumor it fills most of the medullary cavity, so there is no hematopoiesis occurring within the medullary cavity of the bone and also the proximal diaphysis. So it is infiltrated through the cortex, lifted the periosteum and formed a cordman triangle and it has also formed soft tissue masses on both sides of the bone. So it has infiltrated the cortex, skipped through it and in, uh, infiltrated the soft tissues as well. So moving on to cartilage forming tumors, cartilaginous tumors account for the majority of benign and malignant primary bone tumors. They are characterized by the formation of hyaline and or myxoid cartilage, fibrocartilage and elastic cartilage are rare. So mostly hyaline or myxoid cartilage is formed. Okay, remember hyaline is eosinophilic. Okay, 
so benign cartilage tumors are much more common than malignant tumor uh, malignant lesions so osteochondroma osteochondroma or exostosis okay it is a most benign bone tumor so it is attached to the skeleton by a bony stalk cat by cartilage okay so approximately 85% of osteochondromas are solitary and sporadic with the remainder occurring as part of an autosomal dominant multiple hereditary exostosis syndrome solitary osteochondromas are usually diagnosed in late adolescence and early adulthood but multiple osteochondromas become apparent during childhood men are affected three times more than women osteochondromas develop only in bones of endochondral origin only in bones of endochondral origin remember this most common site is a metaphysis near the growth plate of long tubular bones especially near the knee followed by the bones of the pelvis scapula and ribs where they tend to have short stalks osteochondromas present a slow growing masses which can be painful if they impinge on a nerve or if the stalk is fractured in many cases they are detected incidentally in multiple hereditary exostosis syndrome the underlying bones may be buffed and shortened reflecting an uh, associated disturbance in epiphyseal growth moving on to the pathogenesis so hereditary exostosis are associated with germline loss of function mutations in either ext1 exostosis 1 or the exe exososis 2 gene and subsequent loss of the remaining wild type allele in chondrocytes of the growth plate reduced expression of ext1 or ext2 has also been observed in sporadic osteochondromas these genes encode enzymes that synthesize heparin sulfate glycosaminoglycans so hs gags okay ext1 and 2 mutations loss of function mutations so they re- cause reduction or loss of chondrocytes of the growth plate okay so it uh, basically these genes encode enzymes for hs cags and the reduced or abnormal glycosaminoglycans may prevent normal diffusion of indian hedgehog a local regulator of cartilage growth thereby disrupting hedgehog signaling and chondrocyte differentiation okay so morphology osteochondromas are sessile or pedunculated mostly they are attached by a stalk to the bone they range in size from 1 to 20 cm the ga- cap is composed of benign hyaline cartilage here you can see they are attached by a stalk like structure they are sessile or ped- uh, pedunculated okay and the cap is more often made of benign hyaline cartilage and it is covered by perichondrium obviously okay the cartilage has the histological appearance of a disorganized growth plate and undergoes endochondral ossification with newly made bone forming the inner portion of the head and the stalk so the outer you have the perichondrium okay the inner portion is then endochondrally ossified the cortex of the stalk merges with the cortex of the host bone so that the medullary cavity of the osteochondroma is in continuity with that of the bone from which it arises so moving on to the clinical features they usually stop expanding at the time of growth plate closure and when symptomatic are cured by simple excision secondary chondrosarcoma occurs rarely usually in tumors associated with multiple hereditary exostosis then chondroma so chondroma is a benign tumor of hyaline cartilage that occurs in bones of endochondral origin tumors can arise within the medullary cavity where they are termed endochondromas or on the bone surface where they are called juxtacortical chondromas endochondromas are the most common intraosseous cartilage tumor they are typically solitary metaphyseal lesions of tubular bones of hands and feet radiographically endochondro sorry enco enchondromas sorry not endochondromas enchondromas display a circumscribed lucency with central irregular calcifications a sclerotic rim and an intact cortex so here you can see in this figure so here you can see an intact cortex a sclerotic rim okay an intact cortex okay so central irregular calcifications here here you can see irregular central calcifications which are in white the cortex is intact and uh, a sclerotic rim is present so olea disease and mafuchi syndrome okay chondroma okay on ro oma okay so olier's disease o for olier and again ma so mafuchi syndrome are non hereditary disorders characterized by multiple enchondromas mafuchi syndrome is distinguished by the presence of spindle cell hemangiomas and other non cartilage neoplasms 
so m has n so what is n non cartilage neoplasms such as hemangiomas so enchondromas are most often diagnosed between 20 and 50 years of age when they involve large bones enchondromas are usually asymptomatic and detected incidentally occasionally they can be painful or cause pathologic fractures in enchondromatosis the tumors may be numerous and large producing severe deformities moving on to the pathogenesis heterozygous mutations in the idh1 and idh2 genes are present within enchondromas individuals with enchondroma uh, syndromes are generally mosaic harboring idh mutations in a subset of otherwise normal cells throughout their bodies similarly idh mutations are present in only a subset of tumor cells in both syndromic and sporadic enchondromas the, the unusual situation may be explained by functional consequences of idh mutations which cause the encoded proteins to isoforms of the enzyme isocitrate dehydrogenase idh to an, to acquire a new enzymatic activity that leads to the synthesis of 2 hydroxy glutarate this onco metabolite interferes with the regulation of dna methylation so it is hypothesized that 2 hydroxy glutarate produced by idh mutated cells diffuses into neighboring cells with normal idh genes thereby causing oncogenic epigenetic changes in genetically normal neighbors a phenomenon referred to as transformation by association by epigenetic changes of mutated idh idh genes okay the products the onco metabolites which is 2 hydroxy glutarate all right so moving on to the morphology Enchondromas are well sub- circumscribed nodules. Okay, they're benign, so well circumscribed. They're usually smaller than three centimeters. They're grey blue and translucent. Histologically, enchondromas are composed of hyaline cartilage containing cytologically benign chondrocytes. Peripheral uh, endochondral ossification may occur, and the center can calcify, obviously, and infarct. The enchondromas in Olea disease and Maffucci syndrome are sometimes more cellular than sporadic enchondromas and can exhibit cytological atypia, making them difficult to distinguish from chondrosarcomas. So here you can see that the growth potential of chondrosarcomas is limited. Treatment depends on the clinical situation and its usually observation or curettage. So solitary chondromas rarely undergo sarcomatous transformation but those associated with enchondromatosis do so more frequently. So individuals with Maffucci syndrome develop multiple enchondromas and spindle cell hemangiomas and are also at risk for developing other malignancies including brain gliomas another type of cancer associated with IDH gene mutation so you have spindle cell hemangioma multiple enchondroma and brain gliomas which are associated with IDH gene mutations. So here you can see an enchondroma composed of a nodule of hyaline cartilage encased by a thin layer of reactive bone. Okay. So all this is hyaline cartilage. There's a thin layer of reactive bone. Okay. Moving on to chondrosarcoma. So chondrosarcomas are malignant cartilage producing tumors that are subclassified histologically as conventional clear cell differentiated and mesenchymal variants. So after osteosarcoma chondrosarcoma is the second most common malignant matrix producing tumor of bone individuals with oste- co- individuals with chondrosarcoma are usually in their 40s or older and men are affected twice as frequently as women most are of the co- uh, conventional histologic type the clear cell and mesenchymal variants occur in young people uh, in their teens and in their teens or 20s so chondrosarcomas commonly arise in the axial skeleton especially the pelvis shoulder and ribs but unlike benign enchondroma distal extremities are rarely involved so on imaging the calcified matrix of chondrosarcoma appears as foci of flocculin densities this so chondrosarcoma remember it foci of flocculin densities So slow growing low grade tumors cause reactive cortical thickening whereas aggressive high grade neoplasms destroy the cortex and form soft tissue masses. The clear cell variant is unique in that it originates in the epiphyses of long tubular bones. Okay so remember this about the clear cell variant. About 15% of conventional chondrosarco- chondrosarcomas are secondary and arise from enchondromas or osteochondromas. Moving on to the pathogenesis 
So although chondrosarcomas are genetically heterogeneous, but few recurrent driver mutations are recognized. So chondrosarcomas existing in multiple osteochondroma syndrome exhibit mutations in the EXT genes, uh, okay, exostosis genes. Uh, while both chondromatosis related and sporadic chondrosarcomas may have uh, IDH1 or IDH2 mutations. So silencing of the CDKN28 tumor suppressor uh, gene or locus by DNA methylation is a relatively co- is relatively common in sporadic tumors. So conventional uh, co- chondrosarcomas are large bulky tumors made up of nodules of glistening gray white translucent cartilage but the matrix is often gelatinous or mixoid chondro okay cartilage the matrix is gelatinous or mixoid and can ooze from the cut surface so here you can see okay nodules of hyaline and mixoid cartilage so you here you can see all this hyaline cartilage and mixoid cartilage okay that permeate the medullary cavity grow through the cortex and form a relatively well sub- uh, circumscribed soft tissue mass okay here uh, also the matrix is quite gelatinous and liquidy and it oozes out from the cut surface the spotty calcifications are typically present and central necrosis may create cystic spaces tumor spreads through the cortex and into surrounding muscle and fat histologically neoplastic cartilage infiltrates the marrow space and surrounds pre-existing bony trabeculae chondrosarcomas vary in cellularity degree of cytologic atp and mitotic activity and on this basis are graded from 1 to 3 D differentiated chondrosarcoma is a low grade chondrosarcoma with a second high grade component that does not produce cartilage. Clear cell chondrosarcoma contains sheets of large malignant chondrocytes that have abundant clear cytoplasm, numerous osteoclast type giant cells and intralesional bone formation. So mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is composed of islands of well differentiated hyaline cartilage surrounded by sheets of primitive appearing small round cells. moving on to the clinical features so chondrosarcoma is present as painful progressively enlarging masses the histologic grade correlates directly with the biologic behavior most conventional chondrosarcomas are grade 1 tumors which only rarely metastasize and have five year survival rates of up to 80 to 90% in contrast 70% of grade 3 tumors spread hematogenously especially to the lungs and five year survival is only 43% Treatment of conventional chondrosarcoma is wide surgical excision but mesenchymal and de-differentiated tumors require excision and adjuvant chemotherapy because of their more aggressive clinical course. And finally moving on to tumors of unknown origin we have Ewing sarcoma which is a malignant bone tumor characterized by primitive round cells without obvious differentiation. Ewing sarcomas account for approximately 6 to 10% of primary malignant bone tumors. and follow osteosarcoma as the second most common group of bone sarcomas in children approximately 80% of patients are younger than 20 years of age boys are affected slightly more often than girls and there is a striking predilection for caucasians the individuals of african or asian descent are rarely affected so ewing sarcoma usually arises in the diaphysis of long tubular bones especially the femur and the flat bones of the pelvis and presents as a painful enlarging mass the si- the affected site is frequently tender warm and swollen there may be systemic findings that mimic infection including fever elevated e- uh, sedimentation rate or esr and uh, anemia and leukocytosis radiographs show a destructive lytic tumor with v- with permeative moth eaten margins that extend into surrounding soft tissues the characteristic periosteal reaction produces layers of reactive bone deposited in an onion skin fashion okay So greater than 90% of Ewing sarcomas contain a balanced translocation involving the EWS Ewing sarcoma R1 gene okay so Ewing Ewing sarcoma EWSR1 gene on chromosome 22 in a large majority of tumors the other partner is the FLI1 gene on chromosome 11 11 and 22 okay so creating an EWSR1 and FLI fusion gene so this gene encodes a chimeric protein that binds to chromatin and dysregulates transcription leading to uncontrolled growth and abnormal differentiation through uncertain mechanisms the cell of origin is not certain but mesenchymal stem cells and primitive neuroectodermal cells are most likely moving on to the morphology of ewing sarcoma so it usually arises in the medullary cavity and invades the cortex periosteum and soft tissue 
The tumor is soft, tan white and frequently contains areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. It is composed of sheets of uniform small round cells with scant cytoplasm that may be due to abundant glycogen. Here you can see there is abundant glycogen. Okay, scant cytoplasm. Okay, it can, the cytoplasm can be clear. So when present, Homer right rosettes, which are rounded cell clusters uh, with a central fibrillary core, indicate neuroectodermal differentiation. Okay, fibrous septa may also be present, but there is little stroma and geographic necrosis may be prominent. So here you can't see any stroma. You can see clear cytoplasm, which is scant and clear because of abundant glycogen. You can see uniform small round cells and you can see Homer right rosettes. Okay, lots of rosettes. Okay, which are rounded cell clusters with the central fibrillary core, indicating neuroectodermal differentiation. So, although clinical Ewing sarcoma is aggressive, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgical excision and adjuvant chemotherapy with or without radiation has achieved 75% five-year survival and 50% long-term cure rates. And chemotherapy-induced necrosis is a positive prognostic indicator. Moving on to giant cell tumors, so it is characterized by the presence of numerous multinucleated osteoclast type chain cells, also called osteoclastoma. It is also called osteoclastoma. Although giant cell tumors are benign, they can be locally aggressive. This uncommon tumor usually arises in the third to fifth decades of life. Moving on to the pathogenesis, most cells within with, within giant cell tumors are non-neoplastic osteoclasts and their precursors. So what do osteoclasts have? They have rank. Okay, so the neoplastic cells are primitive osteoblast precursors. Ne neoplastic cells. What do they have? Rank ligand. So they have high levels of rank ligand, which in turn promotes the proliferation of osteoclast precursors and the differentiation into mature osteoclasts. The absence of normal feedback between osteoblasts and clasts result in, results in localized but highly destructive bone resorption. The neoplastic cells have, have acquired mutations in the gene encoding histone 3.3, a chromatin packaging protein. <coughs> Precisely how this leads to tumor formation is unknown. Giant cell tumors develop within the epiphysis and may extend into the metaphysis. The majority are near the knee, involving the distal femur or proximal tibia, but virtually any bone can be involved. Because they typically arise near the joints, giant cell tumors may cause arthritis-like symptoms. They can also present with pathologic features. So morphologically, you can see that they often destroy the overlying cortex, resulting in a bulging soft tissue mass delineated by a thin shell of reactive bone. Okay, here you can see it has destroyed the cortex. Okay, there is only a thin layer of surrounding bone. Okay, reactive bone. So grossly, the tumors are large red-brown masses that frequently undergo cystic degeneration because obviously if all of this is destroyed, then there is only cystic degeneration. Histologically, the tumors consist of tu uniform oval mononuclear tumor cells and abundant osteoclast-type giant cells with 100 or more nuclei. So here you can see osteoclast giant cells with lots of nuclei, 100 or more nuclei, okay, here you can see. Uh, necrosis and mitotic activity may be prominent, obviously, because there's lots of nuclei. Although reactive bone may be present, especially at the periphery, uh, tumor cells do not synthesize bone or cartilage. Moving on to the clinical features, so giant cell tumors are treated by keratage, but 40 to 60 percent recur locally. Although up to 4 percent metastasize to the lungs, these can regress spontaneously and are seldom fatal. The rank ligand inhibitor denosumab has shown promise as an adjuvant therapy. Then aneurysmal bone cysts. So ABC is characterized by multi-loculated blood-filled spaces. So aneurysmal bone cysts. Bone cysts filled with blood. So aneurysmal. All age groups are affected, but most cases present in adolescence. ABC develops most frequently in the femur, tibia, and vertebral body posterior elements. So radiographically, ABC is usually an expansile, well-circumscribed lytic lesion with well-defined margins. Most show central lysis and a thin sclerotic eggshell of reactive bone at the periphery. Supporting trabeculae may create a soap bubble appearance on plane films and internal septa with the air fluid levels by computed tomography and magnetic resonance imaging. These findings are not specific as similar radiographic and histological changes can also occur as a reaction to trauma and in association with other bone tumors. Okay, So here you can see ABC aneurysmal bone cyst. 
So pathogenesis in nearly 70% of cases of ABC, chromosome 17, P13, okay, A, B, C, okay, write 1 and 1, while writing A, you write it like this, right, so 17, C is the third letter of the alphabet, so 13, B, just remove the lower one, you get P, so 17, P13, chromosome rearrangements are present within the plump spindle cells and not in multinucleated giant cells, inflammatory cells, endothelial cells or osteoblasts. So, the chromosomal rearrangement results in fusion of the USP6 coding region with, with the promoters of genes that are highly expressed in osteoblasts such as CDH11. So, USP6 encodes a ubiquitin specific protease. So, USP ubiquitin specific protease uh, that regulates the activity of NF kappa B transcription factor, which in turn upregulates the expression of proteins such as matrix metalloproteinases proteases that lead to cystic bone resorption okay so ABC is consists of multiple blood filled cystic spaces separated by thin tan white septa so you can see this in this figure so you have thin tan white septa okay okay and then the septa are composed of plump spindle cells you can see all these spindle cells multinucleated osteoclast like giant cells and reactive woven bone lined by osteoblasts so bone deposition typically follows the contours of the fibrous septa approximately one third of cases contain an unusual densely calcified basophilic metaplastic matrix referred to as bo blue bone blue bone is seen in abc what is abc aneurysmal bone cyst okay so necrosis is uncommon unless a pathological feature is present so what are the clinical features there is localized pain and swelling that may result in a limp vertebral lesions and nerve compression. Despite being benign, ABC is locally aggressive and treatment is by curettage or excision. Recurrence occurs in 10 to 50 percent of cases. Now moving on to lesions stimulating primary neoplasms, you have fibrous cortical defect and non-ossifying fibroma. So fibrous cortical defects also known as metaphyseal fibrous defects are common developmental abnormalities in which defective sorry in which fibrous connective tissue replaces bone. This is the most thing, fibrous cortical defects, right? So fibrous tissue replaces the bone. These lesions are present in up to 50% of children older than 2 years of age and typically present as an incidental finding in adolescence. The vast majority arise eccentrically in the metaphases of the distal femur and the proximal tibia. Almost half are bilateral or multiple. Most are less than 0.5 cm in diameter, but those that grow to 5 or 6 cm are classified as non-ossifying fibromas. Both of these lesions, fibrous cortical defects and non-ossifying fibromas are small, sharply demarcated radiolucent masses surrounding, surrounded by thin rim of sclerosis, okay, thin rim of fibrosis. So they are grossly yellow-brown and consist histologically of bland fibroblasts that are frequently arranged in a story form or a pinwheel pattern and macrophages that can take the form of clustered cells with foamy cytoplasm or multinucleated giant cells. Hemocytrin is commonly present. Okay, that is why they are brown, yellow brown. Here you can see a pinwheel pattern. Okay, pinwheel pattern uh, sto or story form pattern created by benign spindle cells with scattered osteoclast type giant cells and also macrophages, foamy macrophages. So clinical features include fibrous cortical defects which are asymptomatic uh, they are detected instantly on radiographic studies. The radiographic findings are sufficiently specific that biopsy is rarely necessary. Most fibrous cortical defects have limited growth potential and undergo spontaneous resolution over time as they are replaced by normal cortical bone. The few that progressively enlarge into non-ossifying fibromas may present with pathological fracture or require biopsy to exclude other types of tumors. They are treated with curettage and may require bone grafting for, for, uh, for proper healing. Moving on to fibrous dysplasia. It is a benign tumor that has been likened to localized developmental arrest. All of the components of normal bone are present but they do not differentiate into mature structures. The lesions arise during skeletal development and appear in several distinctive but sometimes overlapping clinical patterns. So monostotic, it includes involvement of a single bone, polyostotic, involvement of multiple bones and Mazabrod syndrome. So fibrous dysplasia, usually polyostotic and soft tissue myxomas, McCune Albright syndrome. So polyostotic disease associated with cafe olet, uh, skin pigmentations and uh, endocrine abnormalities, especially precocious puberty. 
moving on to the pathogenesis all forms of fibrous dysplasia result from somatic gain of function mutations in GNAS1 okay which encodes the simulatory subunit of GS G, cup, uh, G protein coupled receptor and it is also mutated in pituitary adenomas that is why you have pitu uh, endocrine abnormalities the resulting constitutively active GS protein promotes cellular proliferation and disturbs osteoblast differentiation these mutations occur in early embryogenesis and affected individuals are genetic mosaics the phenotype depends on the stage of embryogenesis when the mutation is acquired and also the fate of the cell harboring the mutation at one extreme a mutation during early embryogenesis produces mccune albright syndrome in contrast a mutation in the osteoblast precursor during or after formation of the skeleton results in monostrotic fibrous dysplasia so monostrotic polyostrotic mesabrot syndrome and mccune albright syndrome okay and uh, morphologically the lesions of fibrous dysplasia are intramedullary lytic lesions okay here you can see they are composed of a curvy linear trabeculae okay curvy linear trabeculae of woven bone okay that lacks conspicuous osteoblastic rimming and arises in a background of fibrous tissue all of this you can see the background of fibrous tissue so the lesions of fibrous dysplasia are intramedullary lytic lesions that may expand and cause bowing and cortical thinning periosteal reaction is absent usually and lesional tissue is tan white and gritty on cross examination and composed of curvy linear trabeculae of woven bone surrounded by a moderately cellular okay moderately cellular fibroblastic proliferation without prominent osteoblastic rimming nodules of hyaline cartilage with the appearance of disorganized growth plates are generally present in approximately 20% of cases cystic degeneration hemorrhage and foamy macrophages are also common monostrotic fibrous dysplasia occurs in early adolescence and often stops enlarging at the time of early growth plate closure so the femur tibia ribs jaw bones and calvarium are most commonly affected the lesion is frequently asymptomatic and usually discovered incidentally but may cause pain discrepancies in limb length and pathological fracture growth of the lesions may be reactivated during pregnancy and symptomatic lesions are treated by keratage but recurrence is common polyostrotic fibrous dysplasia manifests at a slightly earlier age than the monostrotic type and may continue to cause problems into adulthood the femur skull and tibia are most frequently affected craniofacial involvement is present in 50% of those who have a moderate number of bones affected and in 100% of those with extensive skeletal disease involvement of the shoulder and pelvic girdle results in progressive disease and may produce crippling deformities and fractures that require multiple corrective orthopedic surgical procedures bisphosphonates can be used to reduce the severity of bone pain a rare complication usually in the setting of polyostrotic involvement is malignant transformation of a lesion into a sarcoma Mazabrot syndrome presents with skeletal features of polyostrotic fibrous dysplasia obviously in childhood followed by the appearance of intramuscular myxomas in adulthood m for muscular myxomas often in the same anatomic region as existing fibrous dysplasia although benign myxomas can cause local compression symptoms or limb deformity but are cured by surgical excision the most common clinical presentation of mccune albright syndrome is obvious precocious sexual development cafe or late uh, uh, appearance of skin Okay, so the syndrome can include other endocrinopathies such as hyperthyroidism, pituitary adenomas that secrete growth hormone, and primary adrenal hyperplasia. Bone lesions are often unilateral, and skin lesions, when present, are limited to the same side of the body. The cutaneous lesions are classically large macules, dark to cafe au lait in color, with irregular serpiginous borders. Skeletal manifestations are managed as for polyostrotic fibrous dysplasia while the endocrinopathies are treated medically that is with aromatase inhibitors for precocious puberty Finally we have metastatic tumors which are the most common form of skeletal malignancy greatly outnumbering the primary bone cancers the pathways of spread to bone include direct extension lymphatic or hematogenous dissemination and intraspinal seeding via the Batson's uh, paravertebral venous plexus okay so any cancer can spread to bone but in adults more than 75% of skeletal metastases originate from cancers of the prostate breast kidney and lung in children neuroblastoma wilms tumor osteosarcoma ewing sarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma are the most common metastases to bone 
Skeletal metastases are typically multifocal. However, carcinomas of the kidney and thyroid may present with solitary lesions. Most metastases involve the axial skeleton in which the marrow has a rich capillary network. The radiographic appearance of metastases may be lytic, bone destroying, blastic, bone forming or mixed lytic and blastic. Some cancers are associated with predominantly one pattern. For example, prostatic adenocarcinoma is predominantly blastic, whereas car- carcinomas of the kidney, lung and GIT and malignant melanoma produce lytic lesions. Bidirection and interactions between metastatic cancer cells and native bone cells account for the changes in the bone matrix. Tumor cells do not directly resorb bone in lytic lesions, but they secrete substances such as prostaglandin, cytokines and uh, parathyroid hormone related protein or peptide sorry, that upregulate rank ligand on osteoblast and stromal cells thereby stimulating osteoclast activity. Conversely, tumor cell growth is supported by the release of matrix bound growth factors so TGF, beta, IGF-1 and FGF as the bone is resorbed. Sclerotic metastasis may result from tumor cells secreting WNT proteins that stimulate osteoblastic bone formation. The presence of bone metastasis portends a poor prognosis because it indicates wide dissemination of a cancer. Goals of therapy are symptomatic relief and prevention of further spread. When treated, options include systemic chemotherapy or immunotherapy, localized radiation and bisphosphonates. So surgery may be necessary to stabilize the pathological fractures, particularly when metastasis involves the spine. Finally, summarizing with the key concepts of bone tumors and tumor-like lesions, the majority of bone tumors are classified according to the normal cell they resemble or matrix produced. The remainder are grouped by clinical pathologic features. Most primary bone tumors are benign and metastasis, especially adenocarcinomas, are more common than primary bone neoplasms. Major categories of primary bone tumors include the following. So bone forming, you have blastic lesions, osteoblastoma and osteoid. Osteoma consists of benign osteoblasts that synthesize osteoid. Osteosarcoma is a a tumor of malignant osteoblasts with an aggressive clinical course that predominantly involves adolescents. Then you have cartilage forming. So osteochondroma is a a polypoid exostosis with a cartilage cap. So there is a stalk, okay, like this, cartilage cap, highland cartilage cap. So syndromic forms are most often associated with mutations in EXT genes. Chondromas are benign intramedullary tumors that produce highland cartilage and usually arise in the digits. Chondrosarcomas are malignant tumors of cartilage involving the axial skeleton in adults. Ewing sarcoma is an aggressive malignant small round shell tumor associated with translocation 11 is 22. Okay, the fusion protein. And then fibrous cortical defect and fibrous dysplasia are unusual. Uh, developmental abnormalities, the latter is caused by somatic gain of function mutations in the GNAS1 gene during embryogenesis and that is all about bones.